Hey, everybody. Now I don't know where we are. So, uh, Hi, everybody. I'm Jason. This is Allison. I'm Allison. And that's Leo. <laughs> hey, hello. So the title of this talk is Parametric Insurance, <laughs> which is about this much about what we're going to talk about. Uh, as, as often, these things kind of spiral off and... Uh, and basically, we end up opening a can of worms. So uh, there we go. <laughs> Many worms. <laughs> Many worms. Can of worms will turn uh, into cans of fish. Cans of yeah, exactly, exactly. That have all the they're, radioisotopes. They're not GMO worms, <laughs> I hope, but we'll see what happens. Um, anyways, thanks everyone for joining us. And as we move through this presentation slash talk, if you do have questions for us. Feel free to post them in the chat. And then I always ask that you put the word question before the question, because when I'm scanning through the chat, it helps me to pick them out uh, quite easily. And also, by the way, uh, I'm, it, I, I'll am i be commenting as Allison McDowell, because I'm kind of <laughs> running the chat. But if you see anything- We're um, shared identity <laughs> Blame Blame me. <laughs> well, you, you know, they don't, you, YouTube doesn't let me comment on Allison's videos so <laughs> figure that out their algorithms i can just delegate my my psyche to you jason during the live streams that's fine and i, I still, trust you thank you i'm still getting over a, a little <laughs> bit of a cough so i might be like oh, jumping off here um anyhow i might switch this around here too because i'm gonna put me on the bottom because i might pop out periodically to to hack up a lung um anyway so just i'm gonna i'm still actually putting this thing together as we're doing this i got a little bit more work to do on this end of it so why don't allison do you want to kind of start us off here or 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 would it be better for actually, leo it was your request, Jason, i think but since you're coughing, I'll, I'll say i mean so we have this new discourse discussion group and i think the three of us and, and, and a number of others are pretty active in the space. And so at some point, Leo, like there was a really long thread about, was it, I don't know, D-Climate or something yeah, like that? I can't remember what Jason had posted. And that thread got really long. And Jason's like, yeah, like you had posted stuff about parametric insurance. And we said, we should do something on that. And and so we we did. So this is this is the thing. This is and the that thing. title is for when it was just about parametric insurance, but now it's about... <laughs> 17 other things so they're related of course <laughs> but you know so still they all related. build off of um, each other exactly boo that's yeah. the new setup well and can you say a little bit because i know you have some new material out on the radio ecology i mean that was so, a lot of the stuff that i incorporated um around like risk profiling climatic conditions and catastrophes and that sort of thing comes out of the the radio ecology work that you did so maybe you could just say a few a tiny yeah. bit about like what where your headspace has been the last couple months so i guess like the sort of rabbit hole i had fallen into maybe two months ago was looking at the origin of a lot of these international sort of international biological data standards for classifying biodiversity and ecosystem services, which is like a, well, yeah, I guess that's where it all comes from. So ecosystem services is this concept that has been kind of gaining ground in like the environmental space and green finance world. And is the idea that the benefits that nature provides us or, you know, river, like clean water, rivers, air like all the stuff that we just live and like need to exist that it all has like a quantifiable value to the economy so like that say the river hat does 500 million dollars worth of water purification or whatever just that's how the framework they're looking at so i was trying to look into the history of how that came about through the un and whatnot and that led me to the International Biological Program, the IPB, which was in the mid 60s, uh, um, and in part done with UNESCO, but 
the centers for the uh, International Biological Program, one of the main ones was Oak Ridge, that, as in like Oak Ridge National Laboratories, which was in it was the it was a big part of the Manhattan Project and like the early plutonium refinement and the pilot reactors, so making like the smaller scale nuclear reactors to like sort of test their uh, models and stuff. And part of o what Oak Ridge was doing was the a byproduct of the nuclear reactors are radioisotopes, so elements that have they're radioactive elements that can be traced easily in biology, in the earth and whatnot. So what kind of happened after the war is that a lot of focus was put on these radioisotopes because it allowed people to, or allowed like researchers to study the movement of uh, say like food in your body and your metabolism and all this stuff and through the ecosystems. And then through that, Oak Ridge became kind of one of the main centers of ecological research in the United States and the Atomic Energy Commission was the largest funder of ecology, like from the about the 50s to the 60s. And that's where I think a, lot that would shock the, a lot of people. Don't yeah, <laughs> it's just crazy. If you came and you told like sort of the liberal progressive green people to say like the origins of this con conceptualization of like current corporate environmentalism came directly out of the Manhattan Project. <laughs> I don't think most people know that. That's super important. Totally, which t really shocked me. And I knew nothing, like, you know, next to nothing about the Manhattan Project besides like sort of the basic stuff that everybody knows. And around that time you were doing, you had written a couple blog posts about uh, Rochester and there was, there's sort of this Rochester, Manhattan uh, axis and where a lot of the like forced medical experimentation and yeah. other sorts of stuff was going on, which is uh, you know, a part of the, the radioisotopes paradigm. And, it, it, and there's the a lot more radiation. Just, yeah, yeah, keep Interject going. was that in, in Rochester, Kodak Eastman was a major employer. It was a center of optics and sort of um, like optical, like both film and lenses. Bausch and Lohm was there, later Xerox was there. And so, um, Kodak Eastman, during the First World War, the chemicals they needed to create their film, their celluloid, which is cellulose, and processing the film, they they couldn't get it. So they decided to acquire large stretches of forest and timber in um, eastern Tennessee. And so that cellulose product was how they came to have a really large footprint in that where Oak Ridge ended up being. But then additionally, because the cellulose products were highly combustible, like chemically incredible. They, they called it gun cotton because it was literally explosive. And so Kodak, in addition to film, like ended up doing like ordnance stuff too, like explosives because their product was both imprinting, <laughs> visually imprinting and also explosive. explosive um, yeah. So when they started, when Oak Ridge started to do some of the um, exposure around work workforce um, exposure to radiation. They had ties to Rochester, and the medical center there was funded by. Um, I think it was one of the first ones done as after the. Um, oh, why am I getting? I'm blanking on the. The brothers, the Carnegie Corporation, the Flexner Report, like the Fle Flexner Report, like remaking of medicine for the modern age. The Rochester Medical Center was like one of the first funded medical institutions. So they ended up doing a lot of covert work with the Defense Department. So that was like the Rochester, Tennessee link. But interestingly, through the forest, which is part of some of the stuff you had talked about, because I feel like you know, when I'm doing my research, you get these little twinges, like this is important. Like I can't quite put a pin on it on exactly why, but it feels like the networked communication of natural biodynamic systems, especially like complex established forest systems are really central to understanding this new like planned distributed mechanized consciousness thing that's gonna be the blockchain like network, so. Anyway, not to get you off track, but that was the connection. You, no, you might yeah, not no, think, that's, like, that's I don't really think much about Rochester. I never, like, yeah, mid-size upstate New York town, right? And you wouldn't 
realize how it was connected, but it is in a very direct way and it, and it matters. Yeah, and you wouldn't Because now Rochester is just for photonics. And, and the photonics right. is light. And I know you've studied a lot about like both like light in like cosmic rays and other light systems and photosynthesis was one of the things they were really interested in unlocking with the radioisotopes was like how the yeah. photosynthetic process works, which is intimately integrated with alternative energy now and quote unquote greening that's coming. So Right. And like all the ecological models that they're building are based on sensors and satellites generally. And that's all photonics, you know, that's all different types of uh, op using light and not just optical, but microwave, infrared, UV, all that stuff to uh, have as much data as possible about the ecosystems. And that's, which we'll talk about the parametric insurance is uh, feeding both the kind of the new financial markets, like the green finance of the world and the, uh, a lot of this like, transition to ESG and whatnot is all tied up in this. And, so well, I guess we should probably just go and yeah, do start. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it's... laughs> we can just keep. We can talk forever. So and I oh. just finished. Uh, so as we go along, I just finished where we can add at the bottom of the screen here. I can. Uh, I tried to grab through some descriptions here. So I'm I'm adding a little more magic to our show here. But yeah, these are some of the the topics uh, that we wanted. Uh, you know. Well, I mean, essentially what, what I'm realizing is because, um, uh, so I will say like Drew Hempel, who had done a lot of this work on all of our riser, like I have my riser, like I have my little library here, the riser stuff on cosmic humanism and radio eugenics, like super brilliant and has these ideas about like the physics and like non, non communicative non <laughs> And like really important concepts that I, I know are right and I want to understand better because it has these implications for how we think about the universe and our place in it and like navigating this. But I don't, because I didn't have a lot of background, I struggle with having a scaffold to decode, like or understand, I don't have the framework to, to make, I'll get there. I'm going to, Drew, I'm going to, I'm going to keep working on it. But I realized that probably the way I experienced trying to figure out about like sort of abstract physics and meditation and wave forms and things is how other people imagine it for me. <laughs> like when I talk, they're like, I think she's onto something, but I don't really know anything. <laughs> like I get about 20% of what you're saying. And then the rest of it, like, I don't know, because we're not used to thinking in a certain framework. Like you, you have to be, I guess, if you are a good teacher, you scaffold people, like you, you feed them a little bit and then you get, they get a, an understanding and then you layer on the next and the next. So just as my um, like journey with this has been from like data applied to people, to data applied to financial systems, to data applied to blockchain, to data applied to machine learning, like it keeps getting more complex. And I think this next layer that we need for people to gradually acclimate to and come along with us is the radiation, like this idea of um, thermodynamics and economies, like bioeconomies. Um, and thinking about it in new ways. So I just, I put some concepts up there and I don't know exactly how we're gonna um, go like touch on all of them, but this isn't, for me, it wasn't just about, like it was insurance as modeling the way of examining complexity theory and this like attempts on like these crazy peoples like Bernal or whatever to catalyze, I'm terrible at this, um, new forms of life, like new forms of beingness that they can control through their engineering. So, um, I don't know. I, we don't want to walk through all of these right now, do we? Or do no, you want me just no, to give broad strokes? So. I think. Yeah. So ho hopefully we'll hit on some of these for me, like the idea of modeling, which you have spoken to about getting the data for the simulations to create the fictions, right? These financial fictions to run the world. Like the sto stochastics is really central and finding out that like the core part of the, in France, the re work that you had done, Leo, um, early on was funded by Rockefeller, that they were funding modern mathematics, knowing that this was going to be feeding into these simulations and derivatives and complexity theory programs. And so for me, like that sort of builds off of a lot of the work around the parametrics. So yeah, it's all we can it's, keep going. Okay. I don't know. Do you have thoughts? And also, I mean, do you uh, also, I'm not sure if there is like, cause you're referring to like the work that I've done. I'm not sure if there's 
much that's like the video with Sebs is, I'm not sure if that's like public or whatnot. I'm not sure if there's oh, okay. stuff that people that oh, would have, like be able to see. Yeah. See exactly. Um, uh, well, you could yeah, probably I mean, I, share your slide deck, right? Like in, in one of the comments, like we could put a link if you're willing to like make it public yeah, yeah, for that totally. talk too. And then people could, yeah, you know, look through, through that material. Yeah. And that has, that has all the sources and stuff too. So. Yeah. And so for me, like, as we were talking, like you and Jason actually set it up and then I always like, like elbow my way in. I'm like, hey, <laughs> this would be interesting because like having a good case study is always like compelling. And you already had some case studies, but like in the complexity theory, I think the coral reef as like an emergent complex ecosystem is really interesting. And the fact that this, this um, coral reef policy was triggered, I thought that this might be an interesting like use case to explore, um, particularly because it also has some others that I wasn't aware of till I started digging in a little bit more last night. So um, do you want to say a little bit about like the concept? Like for me, I can chime in yeah. on the pay for success side, yeah. which is like they'll assign the ecosystem services value to the reef. But there's also an economic value assigned because the, the location that they have this in, Quintana Roo, which is on the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, and it's um, where Cancun and Cozumel and these very, you know, fancy resorts are, there's also an economic cost if these reefs are damaged yeah. because then people can't, they won't come to vacation if they can't go and scuba dive in the reefs or in that sort I of thing. I think it would be important, um, so that's important the cost to, make, to make clear that the ecosystem services value is financial, it is economic, like okay. in the, like okay. by definition of how they do it. And it takes in to account like tourism and, and all the like human, or like what we would parts. call human um, parts as well. So that it's all sort of wrapped up into one. And I hadn't actually looked at this specific one, but like the basic idea with parametric insurance, which is kind of like a fancy sounding thing, is that when they make, they'll make an insurance contract and the entire basis of the insurance contract is some trigger event. So for ensuring where these have gotten really popular are called catastrophe bonds. So governments would create bonds that um, would be paid out in the event that like a hurricane or a volcano or earthquake happened and the trigger event would be some identifiable metric. So in the case of an earthquake, if it hits like 7.2 on the Richter scale, then the insurance payment is paid out automatically. And like, that's the whole basis. And that's what parametric refers to is just the metrics used to pay out the insurance. And instead of like having an insurer come and assess the damages done to property and then payouts based on that, it's like a, it's all predetermined and automated, which is why it's become like a big target of the web three world and in, in blockchain smart contracts, because you can automate it, you can have it run on smart contracts, you can gather capital through the blockchain and all this sort of stuff. And we'll get more into that. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And I will say at the very end, assuming we get all the way to the end, uh, th th that last paragraph where it talks about that they were using modern portfolio theory, like in looking at, um, a conservation of coral reefs, which was essentially like a risk management. All of this is like risk calculations. And so they were applying this idea of like risk to say, okay, these are the these are our top bets for the most important coral reefs in, in the globe or something like that. But they were using a University of Chicago based theory that dates to the 1960s. Like literally it's the Chicago boys, not just running Chile, but they're going to run your coral reefs. They're going to run like every single bit of like life on planet Earth. So I think that that's a really um, important note to make is that these they're continually updating these complex financial instruments, mathematical instruments to and then applying ones that used historically to new use cases and expanding that. Totally. 
And of course, like right when we start, my cough kicks in. Um, no, I'm sorry. Murphy's Did Law. Did you there. have anything, Jason, you wanted to say? Well, yeah, and I was kind of reading through uh, some of the articles that, that uh, Leo had written and, you know, kind of talking about like bonding curves, how this relates to like alpha bonds and bonding curves. Um, and, and, and then, well, I don't know if you got into this, but like predictive, you know, the predictive side of this. Um, but the, the, the relationship to digital twinning and, and surveillance. So like a lot of this just means like, of course they need, they need more data in order to, to make these, yeah, make these can, policies work. So I, I, we probably have slides to, to get into that, but those were just the initial notes I made about parametric. Yeah. And um, I can quickly say like the whole thing is a digital twin. It's like fundamentally based on predictions. Cause in order to like design and price these insurance contracts, they need like strong models that they believe s tell them certain probabilities of certain events of certain weather events, which is all it's all that's all digital twinning. That's all wet. That's all yeah. mass computer si simulations with machine learning and all that sort of stuff. Um, there's yeah. like no way to just uh, dis have this concept, not like it just wouldn't work without without uh, sim right. like mass simulation. Yeah, and then the other and thing, the thing I is, go ahead. Sorry, no, I was just saying, like when I first started looking at the sustainable development goals, maybe three years ago, and looking at Microsoft and the planetary computer, like before I'd actually stumbled into the digital twin. So much of this is information warfare is how you tell the story, right? And so the story that's being told is that like we need a simulation to be able to run the planet. Otherwise, we're all going to die. Everybody's going to die. The whole planet's going to die. Like the narrative is, is has been set that that one that, that the, the fiction that they can actually manage all of these things. <laughs> and that's a story that they can actually manage it. But um, two, that it's for our own good. And that's what's so central is like we need the technology for our own good. Like we have to submit to the surveillance. Otherwise, the catastrophe will happen. And you know, that's been very clearly laid out at least in the 1970s in sort of the small planet spaceship, limited resources. And again, I'm not to say that like, I wanna do bad things to the planet or be, you know, over, but we're at the culminating point of the story that says we're overpopulated, we're scarce, we're all gonna die, we're on this moment. And, you know, there are other ways of looking at it that I think don't necessarily pre preclude that and preclude like require us to submit to web three and, and and even if we did submit there's no guarantee that they actually can accomplish what they say they're going to accomplish so the other thing that's interesting about like learning about this is just how in order to kind of see what's going on you can't just like study this thing because it's like it's it's all part of like a uh um a system you know the the parametric insurance plays in with the um you know what's going to be cryptocurrency uh, not cryptocurrency but community you know community currency uh, of course their definition of community currency is different than mine um but just how like you can't you can't understand what it is by just looking at like one thing like if i were to just to study parametric insurance uh, i wouldn't really understand what it is if i if i looked at it by itself you know, and so that's one thing. They'll just that say I, it's convenient, right? Look, right. like you don't like look at Hurricane Katrina. It takes you know eight months for an adjuster to come out and look at your devastated house. If we just had smart exactly. contracts, the drone would just fly over and say, "Yep, the house is gone," and pay out whatever like the payout is. And and so it's sort of problem reaction solution. Like I'm sure the insurance companies, knowing this was coming down the, the lane, have created sort of a dysfunctional claim system so that people will be clamoring for it at some point like and and this is this is not exactly a house insurance policy this is something different but it is going to be apl applicable ultimately um to a lot of different um insurance applications yeah and that narrative they really push a lot with agricultural insurance and like smallholder farmers their their arguments like oh the the small farmers have been cut out of the uh insurance markets and they're, they're very vulnerable to, to risks and drought and all this stuff because it's just too costly to ensure uh, operations at that small of a scale. And then the payouts, even if they do get insurance, take months or years. So now we can do these parametric insurance contracts where they get paid out in a week or two based 
purely on whether rain has fallen to if there's a certain amount of rainfall or lack of and, uh, and the and uh, there's over a trillion dollars worth of uninsured like I think I forget the exact numbers but like a, a very large percent of the world's food is produced by uh, farmers on like less than five acres it's like 30 wow. percent or something and around a trillion dollars so they've been really trying to tap into that market and we'll get into some of those that, yeah. those specific well and I would things. say too on the top of that to access those those would be during dig through digital payment portals right like you know blockchain enabled so all of those people if you don't have a smart you're going to need to get that right and, and then it enables like the the expansion of whatever telecommunications infrastructure into the most remote areas which it, it legitimizes that right because they're like well in order for them to access these services you need this that and the other and i think increasingly with some of the edge computing and alternative telecom they're even places that seem very remote for like telecommunications access are not going to be that remote like within the next 10 to 15 years like they have plans for certain technologies that are going to make them connected much more fast much more quickly or if even if they're not connected in their home like somewhere in the village is going to be a place that they can go and like connect up like it may not be like directly so that that digital infrastructure has to be installed and all of these services whether it's ubi or whether it's insurance or whether it's online education are forcing that yeah, yeah. and to and from what i've seen too they don't need smartphones they've the the systems they've come oh, up with okay. you can use flip phones and you can text it's through a system called ussd and specifically with um, Safricom is the telecommunications provider, but you basically like text a certain code and then you can access like your bank account essentially and it'll like send you back your account balances and stuff. And so the, these insurance contracts that the farmers are being sold, it's all, okay. they just like text a code and it's being sent to them and it's wow. connected with the blockchain. So it's it's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. I read yeah. the, uh, the, one of the terms in one of the articles, and I don't remember which article it was, but they called it participatory surveillance. That's where you're getting people oh, wow. to to give you feedback. But the the term they 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 coined was participatory surveillance. And I was thinking about how like this whole new system is actually in many ways like a it's a way of governing people by other means, like like outside right. of the traditional criminal statutory legal system, you're 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 creating a governance system where you're you're getting you're you're getting you're coercively uh, pushing people or nudging people into different directions, getting their compliance based on punishment and reward. Um, it, anyways, it's just it's interesting to think about this in terms of of governance, you know, digital governance, cybernetics. That's right. Kubernetes. <laughs> now I had to go back and find this image because I this is what, something I used in one of my very first blog posts, like at least the first year I was doing blogging. And I but it it struck me. I was like, wow, I really this is in a this is an important visual. So this is from a report from uh, 2014. Actually, I think okay, there the, it's a Rockefeller Foundation report. It's called Innovations in Social Finance from 2014. So, you know, we're eight years out. And it's sort of like where the investment capital is going to come from for at that time for me it was social impact. Now it's ESG, right? Like they hadn't really rolled out the ESG in, in a great detail at the time. And so a lot of the money that I was following was was that like little narrow yellow section, which were like foundations and development finance and rich people. But they were creating the market conditions that would enable everybody to come behind. So they created the test cases, the use cases, the research, the think tanks, all of the infrastructure that would allow it to scale. But the biggest chunks the, the largest is pension funds, but then the second largest is insurance company premiums, like I guess all kinds of insurance. And I, yeah, I'm not super familiar with all of the insurance space, but that number sort of shocked me, 39% of like the investment capital is in insurance companies. That's a really significant number. And this is Rockefeller saying this, right? So they're targeting like, how are we gonna get the ESG stuff, um, you know, all of our 401ks, that's the pen, you know, and the pension funds are there, and then these insurance companies. So they have a huge stake in needing places to put their money, right? And and I've, I've often talked about, you know, the the big short, you know, the 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 
you know, asset-backed securities, the synthetic debt products that were created with the mortgage and the real estate. But now essentially we're creating synthetic debt with all forms of life, like every living thing in the ecosystem and all the relationships. So um, insurance is important. I will just chime in from the education side, a huge player in that was the MacArthur Foundation. And back in the 40s and 50s, the MacArthur Foundation, it was insurance. And they were like one of the, the, the wealthiest insurance companies around. And many of the hedge funds that are doing the betting are in Connecticut. And Connecticut is also a center for the insurance in the industry, like in New Jersey, Prudential, Hartford. And again, like that's not even to point out Swiss reinsurance and then the big global ones. But I just, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts, but for me, looking back, I'm like, clearly the investment, I mean, the insurance companies have a very clear interest in making sure that these parametric insurance markets are set up because they want them automated because the AI is going to be running these deals. They need automation and scalability. What when came I, to mind, oh. No, you go, you go ahead. I'll go after. Okay. Um, what came to mind for me for the, like what you're talking about on why the insurance companies are so central is they're one of the main... I guess like institutional bodies that assess like risk in society, mm -hmm. like risk of there that's like that's what they're all about is data and calculating the probability and the cost of events, um, which is very similar to the idea that social impact finance is kind of based off of, which is the cost offsets for fixing a person or having an intervention at a certain point because of their data says that if you do that, then down the line, they'll save you this much money. And that's like basically the same like calculus that the insurance companies are always doing. And when they do that, they can also all these, there's all sorts of securitization and bundling of insurance contracts. And that includes like the catastrophe bonds and all the parametric insurance. And that's where reinsurance comes into it. It's the specifics are kind of hard, but it's essentially other insurance companies or other financial bodies that take on some of the capital risk that the insurance company takes on originally with the contract. So it's kind of just ballooning of securitization <laughs> and stuff and like all the debt. I don't even really know how reinsurance works. There, right? It's yeah. like, I mean, I didn't even really know it till I saw Swiss Re. Like, what is that? You know, if you, unless you live in that world, you have no idea like how much power they have. And again, with risk, like what you're talking about is nudging and automation and smart, like cyber physical systems that are constantly evaluating risk and assessing it and readjusting and potentially using, you know, economic incentives or physical interventions in the way people live to to get the outcomes they're looking for it's kind of creepy and that's and that's why people like it's people have a hard time or it's like kind of hard to see how like insurance companies are tied to the military and all that sort of stuff but it's the same it's not a different it's a very similar perspective or thought process like being hyper focused on that risk assessment and having like all these calculations on the value of things and how yeah. likely events are going to occur. It's the same sort of thing as military simulations and war gaming and whatnot. So it's, yeah. yeah. Well, and the one thing I wanted to say, which I'm always, I'd be remiss to not mention it too, which is when we talk about these funds and this money, we're really talking about monopoly money and, and it's, it's a game. I mean, the whole thing is a game. And um, I mean, it's good to talk about how the game is played, but, um, and, and, and I know I need to do more on this as well but you know remembering that uh you know you're playing th this game of monopoly but there's uh th those who actually create you know manufacture the board and and print up the rules uh because i think that's just it's a trap that people always fall into because we, we start thinking about money as it's as a natural thing and uh, all these markets it's just like the whole thing's fictional the whole thing is a game it, it's 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 not a matter of tweaking it here and there and like oh you know like you know i've got a book back there you know the secrets of the federal reserve and i got back when high school because i want to understand that and the whole thing was talking about like um you know the 
the management of it like oh how much interest rates are we going to you know raise and it's like no 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 like this whole thing <laughs> they, they could create as much money or as little as they want like tomorrow so um but we always have to keep that in the back of our minds as as we talk about like oh this is how much money is going to this or that you know what i mean so that's you know i think it's really important to remember that 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 the whole thing is a game and not you know when we start talking about it to not you, you almost like you have to take it seriously because it affects our lives and such and the and, and the world in such a deep way but um in in coming up with solutions we need to not be attached to the game itself if that makes i don't know if that makes any sense or what. Yeah. it sounds like a tangent but it's not <laughs> I mean, the money and the simulation, right? Because that's, I mean, the thing, even with the human res the human capital side of pay for success, it's always, it's pre-crime. It's pre, like you're creating a deficit society because there's a profit in identifying someone as deficient so that you can fix them. There's actually no um, financial benefit in the way this game is played to have a healthy society, to have a well-adjusted society, to have people have enough, to have nature be in, in a good place. It's, the, the game is predicated on the fact that it's, it's trauma-based, it's all trauma-based and, and, you know, and it's predictive trauma, right? So even if you're not traumatized yet, they're going to predict that you're going to be traumatized and then like do something and say, see, we did, we kept you from being traumatized, even though that whole thing just might be a story that you're living in, in the simulation. Right. And the reason why I mentioned that too, is just because, you know, you'll have people that will be like progressive or whatever, like, well, well, maybe we can come up with another, a better, a better way of doing this. And, and my argument is there is no good way of doing this. Like this whole thing is a construct and there, it's not a matter of, you know, rearranging the deck chairs or whatever. Uh, anyway. Allison, I was oh, sorry. Can you go back for a second? I was yeah, a little sure. confused about that that graphic. Like, what, what, like, what capital are they referring to exactly? Like, like where investment capital lives? Like, is that like all capital they're talking about? Or because obviously that's or that wouldn't make sense. Cause there's like banks and other things, but. I mean, I guess I'm. I could look I at mean, the. This, I can look at the yeah. link and the. Probably, I mean, where's the source? Like, I just didn't get the chance. I mean, they're 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 yeah. citing the OECD Foundation Center or and and Deloitte oh, around yeah. that. So maybe that's it's possible oh, yeah. that that's simply money that's earmarked for in impact investment as opposed to all capital. You know, right, maybe that's right. like the capital that, that's makes sense. that's earmarked for quote unquote social finance this is this is sort of where where it lives um sorry to put you on the spot with that no 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 it's okay i mean it's a good question um i mean i again it's also it's the game and it's the rockefellers game so they, yeah, they make yeah, paper yeah. That's, that's how they see things and then they may you know then they operate on that presumption um whether or not that that's very specific but i do think um the other thing I meant, I forgot to mention, because I didn't actually make a slide of this, but in, and I, I'm just slowly wading into the climate, like weather green space, but in the, in the human services side, like Kaiser Permanente is a huge player in the insurance and they're all about the support of housing and the wraparound housing services. So they're now like very into pay for success as their insurance premiums as preventative care and wellness, which of course, we'd like for people to have stable housing and we would like for people to be healthy, but it is going to be embedded within a cyber physical like governance system that is the Web3. And so like not just like I, I've seen examples like with MacArthur and the ed tech with Kaiser Permanente and the health wellness tied to housing um, stability that these insurance companies have um, a very clear financial interest in having these products scale. Um, but they tell a really nice story often about like how they care about injustice or fixing things when actually their whole product, the whole premise runs on continued, like slightly ameliorated harm, <laughs> which is what it, it really is, at least on the, on the human capital side. So, so I just wanted to start. So for me, it feels like there's like these two, different world like lenses and you know we're not here like i mean i think you guys can probably have a sense of like which one i would like align with but like two 
views of the natural world and like how we exist in the natural world. And it's interesting because as much as I keep looking at that foundation for the study of cycles, all of these insurance companies and actuarial companies and risk assessments, like what Dewey says is like, unless you're tapped into the like harmonized six, cyclical nature, you're gonna get it wrong because you actually can't stop cycles or change cycles, cycles are cycles. And so it, it seems like there's a subset of people who understand sort of the expansive nature of the universe as waveforms of very, like very highly complex and harmonized waveforms that are cycles that lead to outcomes in the material world. But there's like a tiny, tiny group of people who know that. <laughs> and then they let everybody else just run the think tanks and the World Banks and the Economists to play in that game while they're over there. And they like they know the sort of secret sauce is, is sort of what I'm, I'm hearing. So I feel like so I will start with saying Sophia Smallstorm. We had a talk like a number of months ago and she was telling me about. And if I get this wrong, Sophia, like it's it's all on me because I'm remembering it incorrectly. But what I took away from it was this idea because pi is infinite, that when you create a circle as a mathematical model, like it's only an abstract representation, but it can never actually be a firm enclosure in and of itself because nature isn't closed in that way. <laughs> and so we can use a circle as a shorthand, but because of the nature of pi is infinite, it's always going to be a shorthand for the real thing, which is something that doesn't have a closed loop. Um, and these folks, all of the insurers, the cyberneticists, they're working from the closed loop principle as opposed to like an expanding spiral principle. And so like as we walk through this stuff, I think and, and increasingly as the um, digital panopticon like rolls out is understanding that the world is much beyond the circle and that in my my way of thinking that the spiral is much more dynamic and offers more opportunities for um, different futures, you know, as we do. And, and that's the nature of that's that's nature. <laughs> um, you know, I have this the stone spiral on the beach and, and then there's the placenta and sort of the tree of life. Like people have understood this for a really long time and that we, we don't have a handle on all of the things as much as we might like to think that we control all of them. Um, the, the control grid that's coming with the insurance and the risk analysis and the interventions, I think is, is a, sto a, a story engineers like to tell themselves. So. Um, and I, I need to do more work on understanding Drew Hempel's research as well, but from what I've read so far, it's very similar stuff to what you were just saying about Pi and that He's sort of saying that there is basically some sort of fraud in early Greek mathematics that turned the circle from a sort of infinitely, infinitely spiraling up harmonic thing to the closed, uh, the enclosure, and that irrational numbers can't exist. And they're like sort of a false construct is what you're saying. So it's like a pie is an irrational yeah. number. Well, the other the other yeah. challenge is, you know, it, you're even if it's just they're not just creating an enclosed structure of natural processes. There there's an incredible amount an increasing a uh, uh, increasing number of of elements within that enclosed enclosure that are just totally artificial from like the big, from get to, you know start to finish. And so in terms of talking about cycles like how does that play into it when they're actually, you know, manufacturing and manipulating the situation? It's they're not just taking a natural. It's not just like an aquarium or something or like a a, a terrarium, you know, where they're you're, you know they're enclosing something that's natural. It, it, it's 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 much more than that, you know. Um, it's like well, I would say do we like cycles and be God. <laughs> well, like Dewey's perspective, at least. I mean. And I, I think that there are some people who are at very high level, like trading, like hedge fund trading and systems theorists, who again, I think it's a very close, like small group of people who, who access this, but that you can't stop a cycle. Like the cycle is the cycle, no matter what this, what it is, whether it's, you know, they measured thousands of things and they collected data for decades and decades that you can dampen a cycle and you can amp it up but you can't actually stop it. 
um, it, it's it's going like whatever it is. And, and they're, they're actually talking about some of it is like based on cosmological, like planetary positioning and things like that. Like which if you understand it as an as like a ma electromagnetic system, it's it's really not so far off. Like like the the some of the metaphysics, alchemy stuff starts to blend in with high level theoretical physics and like photonics at some point. Right. It all starts to be like magic. Right. And so I don't know, like I would like to know for sure. Um, what I can do is sort of see that there seem to be like a small number of very collect connected people who are happy to play a different game and let everyone else play the game they think is the main game. And that plays out. And then behind the scenes, there are people who have like additional information um, relating to the cyclical nature, like in, in the open ended nature of the cosmos. Of the cosmos. Well, and so like, I don't know anything about that. But like, like, for example, the Great Depression, you know, from the, the, the research I've done it, you know, there's quite a bit of evidence that points to this being a manufactured event. You know, it wasn't just like, oh, it's it's a it's time had come. It was a literal. Well, I like, would say you should read the book because it's actually available as a PDF because that's what he was hired by Hoover to do was to study yeah, yeah, yeah. the depression. This yeah. is what he came up no, with. No, I'd be so curious to I'd be curious to read it. I think it's worth we do while know Alfred, to, to Alfred to Loomis predicted the Great yeah. Depression. <laughs> Brainwaves and death. But you can predict yeah. things. Well, you know what? Uh, yeah, I predict I'm going to, you know, you can walk yeah, up to someone yeah. and say, I'm going to predict I'm going to punch you in the face. And then you punch him in the face. You know, it's <laughs> exactly. Like... <laughs> I know. You're the skeptic, Jason, and, and that's fine. But I would suggest like his, his book, Dewey's book is, is a PDF. And like I said, if you, once you back out and see all the people who are connected to it, I, um, yeah. It, yeah, I'll, so, I'll look more anyway, into so, it. Anyway, but I, I'm viral and go ahead. And we both. We yeah, both you don't have to. I know you're not going to agree the, with me today. The, but the, I think it's the, the Joseph Farrell book, right? Yeah. And we 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 talked. We I both found out about Dewey's it. Book itself, yeah, is available. Mm -hmm. Like you can on way back. I'm trying to remember. Like, uh, it's somewhere else in the stack. But you want to go on to the next one? So we've got we've got spiral. Yeah. We have dynamism, and then we have homeostasis. <laughs> so the image on the right is from actually a lecture that Irvin Laszlo, who's one of these key uh, systems theorists, um, uh, it was a, a speech he gave to the Baha'i in 1989, I think it was. And essentially what he's talking about is an energy flow system uh, for the earth, like a sort of a solar based energy flow system, which is actually very similar to some of these energetic currencies that like were talked about as early as the 19 teens and 20s and like have come back around. And now, you know, this idea of technocracy, you know, it, it's worth relooking at in evolutionary economics, but I think some of the ideological aspects that have been layered over onto technocracy, like it's the socialists or it's this, I'm like, actually it's a mathematical model that is about a control system and an acclimation system. So. For me, this is the contrast. Like, I, I threw in a, a look, like the, the search term, cybernetic circle. <laughs> I was like, what does a cybernetic circle look like? And the, on, the, on the, the left, that's the cybernetic circle is sort of this, you know, mechanical systems or the attempt to engineer these circles. And, and Laszlo is keeping everything contained because if they're going to actually run their game, they, we have to actually believe that they're effective, right? Like they, we can't say the emperor has no clothes. So they have to actually come up with a whole structure that makes it seem as though they're actually doing what they say they're doing. And, and this is in direct contrast as I see it to a dynamic evolutionary like complex system. They're trying, trying to like put the complex system under a cup, you know, and contain it and then manage it within sort of a, a geofence, geoengineered managed system. So I don't know. Do you, can you guys see the different, like the two? The, is that helpful? Because to me, I think if we can con like constantly revisit, like which which story is being sold to us and what are the motivations, it's useful. Yeah, I mean, I'd say, and it's based on an assumption or like a imprinting an assumption that data exists that there things can be quantified. It's just you can't have a control system if there's unknown, like like unknown unknown and things that aren't quantifiable and i feel like pretty much anybody who has like spiritual or faith practices or is like interrogates the mind like there's not 
there's there's things going on that you can't you can't <laughs> like sense with us like it's not it's a different yeah. you know, reality is a very different so either they they yeah they're training us to think in that way and like yeah really narrow okay well, and I know that you've been doing, like you've done a lot of looking into like telescopes and micro, like, because like, I think once people get in, in their head, wherever that is, um, <laughs> but can like adjust to the fact that our sensory apparatus is really limited in terms of like all that is going on in the world. Like I keep re reiterating that, like people develop tools to expand that and whether or not what how the tools that they develop are actually accurate in representing that which is beyond our ability to know with our five senses. Um, and I think as we develop more and more tools, we we're also increasingly like as we fall into scientism, losing the internal, like the intuitive, like knowing or the in, inner knowing the the pineal you know that 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 tool like we we don't trust many people don't trust that tool like their intuitive tool and they're looking for like the better more emerging technology to expand because everybody wants to know more 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 like that we're not satisfied with just where we are um i don't know it seems like the the tools are tools and knowing how much we don't know like if you actually had the humility to admit how much humans don't know and how much we've been wrong the major interventions that they're talking about, like we would never even be considering, in my opinion. Agreed. Okay. So this is part of one of my big, uh, my radio ecology thing. And so Leo, I'm gonna, so this is the stochastics part. And I was going through your slide deck and sort of putting together the pieces of the people who are in there and looking at the, is it the Institute Henry Poincaré in Paris? This, this Center for Math and Theoretical Physics in 1928, and knowing that the International Board of Education of Rockefeller essentially helped set that up with the idea that this was gonna be a center for modern mathematics and physics. Like they knew that they needed this. Like, and I think the justification at the time was like, so they'd lost so many people in World War One, and they, you know, to get the edge back, like they needed to develop this, um, you know, innovative academy of instruction but specifically around mathematical probability. And then there was, let's see, Emile Borel, who is the French mathematician and in probability, because this is all risk, and the Navy, because again, it's frequency and waves, it's these waveforms. And then the Louis uh, de Broglier, the, the physicist with the, the wave properties. So th this, I guess it goes back to the spiral versus the cybernetic versus the wave and the cycle is that I feel like these guys knew like that it was about the wave, that it was about like the physics of understanding and predicting. And that wasn't there something where, uh, I can't remember who it was, but they took de Broglie's thesis and Einstein was like, he's lifted the veil, like he's lifted the veil on the theory. Yeah. And for me that very much, at the same time, I had been looking into Hoover, who not only hired Dewey to do the work on the cycles, but it was also very closely linked with Belgium and later on, like the Belgian Congo and radiation and Stanford, um, that the Belgians sent him this veiled Isis statue. <laughs> and so when you talk about like lifting the veil and even in this veiled Isis statue, it's talking about life itself like the creation of life itself, that these people, sure, it's about money and it's about control, but it, I do feel like it's increasingly this sort of Dr. Frankenstein godlike drive to be a creator, you know, which Jason goes back to the whole Mormon transhumanist conference. What will you create? We're all creators. Like in the evolutionary algorithm world, we can all create stuff. And so for me, as we, as the backdrop, and we're going to go into a little bit more on the parametric insurance, but regulating systems of life in cycles, like trying to overcome natural cycles and impose new kinds of cybernetic cycles to force people towards this new evolution. Like to force, force if not people, then molecules, the molecules of existing like life into a new form. So yeah, and it's also not, kind of I, I was gonna say, it's also not just one thing too, because there's different, you know, there can be different interests that are that are kind of maybe working towards the same thing with different focuses 
You know, it's not like it's one thing, like even like money, like it's not one thing. It's a whole, it's a whole bunch of different things. And that's where people get confused. Um, I'm still yeah, trying to wrap my mind had... around the Frankenstein thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the Broglier there, he comes from a French noble family. The Brogliers are like French nobility and that goes back to the Austrian empires where they were like crown princes and his brother Marie switches to the top left of him. Uh, Louis is, he was an early like pioneer in X-ray spectroscopy, like using a rotating crystal and having X-rays go through it in order to um, like ascertain different properties of whatever medium the x-rays were going through and just some of that early research and they were both involved in the navy or like early navy wireless communication systems during the uh, world world war one and i don't think they were yeah. in world war ii um, and he was also yeah. involved with he wrote louis uh, de broglier wrote the like first public calling for cern like first um it was like a paper through UNESCO that like calling for the creation of an international, essentially atomic energy like laboratory, but they kind of reframed it as high energy, like particle physics, but it's basically the same thing as nuclear uh, research. And so there's just, that's- So it's sort of like, we don't know what matter is. Cat. Like, I mean, maybe the physicists, like we experience it, but I think there are people messing around in the waveforms in ways that we can't, most the average person can't comprehend. And there's so and many what things, you know, that are unaccountable, right? Like that you're like, well, that doesn't, like in terms of behaviors or things that come up and you're like, well, that's not consistent or logical, but you don't know what the waveforms are doing, like around, like we're energetic, like magnetic things. And so these people, it feels like they've been messing around in the waves for a very long time. and. I do. Inc I did include. I didn't circle this up, but the John Butler Burke, who who was making art, his his so called artificial cells with the radium, and 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 sort of changing what he called life, and he made this irradiated bone broth that he was like, oh look, it's alive. And this was during the time when um, radium was everyone was really interested in the properties, like this transmutational properties of radium. And you know, I think looking back, like these Xenobot things are kind of like, for me, the, the irradiated bone broth, right? Like new forms of life. We've got new forms of life here, guys. We made it with the evolutionary algorithm. And so I think realizing that some of these discoveries have these longstanding precedents of people who've been trying to reinvent life, you know, since the early 20th century is kind of interesting. So. Anyway, that's that's. Oh, yeah, eventually, yeah. we'll get to how insurance fits into that. Yeah. So these are the xenobots. Yeah. <laughs> right. Are they like, alive? <laughs> we'll get back to the insurance. So I'm just talking about like like yeah. I don't, can you pin down life? Right. The cyberneticists think you can pin it down in a geofence circle, like circles upon circles upon circles. And later on, I'll show about how the edge is sort of the emergent space that they imagine their life forms are going to come out of. So. All right, we can, that's mostly, I just want to touch Thank like, you. yeah, living machines. And then the, the, this is the, the ISIS statue, which I, I included like in the discourse thing, but she's holding a lamp, which feels like photonics. And then there's the Ankh in her other hand and she has the veil. It's a very unusual statue. And it was, you know, um, Hoover after World War I scooped up all these documents and took them to Stanford. And he built this library with this tall tower with the carillon that with the bells from the New York um, the World's Fair in in Corona Park <laughs> in Queens, and you know, and and this statue was sent to Stanford, and Stanford was like, couldn't wait to get rid of it. They were like, can we just be done with this? This really ugly statue, <laughs> and and it had an inscription at the base uh, that says, "I am that which was and is and will ever be, and no mortal has yet lifted the veil which covers me." Right. So I am that which was and is and will ever be. And no mortal has yet lifted the veil which covers me. And so that's on this Isis statue. And to me, that seems very clear about the de Broglie, like reference, like lifting the veil on what what this is. And the, the Ankh is the sign of creation. You've got the womb and then you have the phallus and it's this 
like dynamic thing. And the fact that UNESCO, when they're working, this was in the 70s on man and the biosphere, like intentionally incorporated that onk into their um, logo. And then it, it's also been part of like Huxley and others saying, this is man in the environment. It is embedded in the environment that like we are embedded in our situation. And I think in that is how they want to engineer sort of the, this new, these new life forms. So I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's kind of interesting <laughs> we'll get there on the emergence. Like with the M diverging from the Ankh, it's like creating a sort of an alternative path. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like cut, cutting out. Let's get off on the you. side path. Like let's get out of this cybernetic loop. <laughs> And it's probably worth mentioning that the man in the biosphere program was it was pretty much developed like in tandem with national biological program they're very related okay. well and frank molina was working in with unesco too so from caltech like there are lots of people actually uh what's his face bergruen's dad was working at unesco like there's a lot of overlap um with these sort of high level scientists and influential figures um and Let's see, I brought this in because I think Hutchinson and Bateson, like they were connected and I didn't realize. So Hutchinson was an, a mentor to one of the Odom brothers that were like the fathers of a, the ecological movement in the US. And he was at Yale, Hutchinson, and, and Bateson had a connection. Hutchinson was part of the Macy conferences and, and he and Bateson knew each other. And like, I just included this because there's this in the 1970s we started looking at the earth as a cybernetic system as a spaceship as a closed system as um like a material that everything was material and so bateson uh, published steps to an ecology of mind in 1956 and i do think a lot of the radioisotope work that the atomic energy commission was doing tracking both carbon cycles through ecosystems but also medical isotopes like ultimately is going to relate to consciousness and integrating consciousness of like in vivo life in our bodies with the larger ecosystem. Like they're working on this integration, like the the the, the hive mind integration of, of synthesizing life altogether. So the fact that this human potential movement, Bateson was connected um, in Esalen, I'm pretty sure that the guy, is it McC McConaughey? with Ocean Protocol, is that his yeah. name? Trent yeah. McConaughey? Trent like McConaughey. He essentially, yeah, talking about like, you could exercise your potential by caring for the environment through tokenization. Like you you could help self realize your best self by partic participating in tokenomics in this cybernetic system. And I think in these exchanges of, of token and risk and connection and making them all visible to the machine, it's part of the insurance. Like it's part of this next phase of the, you know, the Vernadsky, Teilhard de Jardin, like unity, right? Because ultimately they, they want us to love the environment. And I don't not love the environment, I do, but not on their terms. Like the, the biogeochemistry, they want us to become one and, and they'll frame it as, you know, the Tao or, you know, non-dualism or unity or whatever, or ascension. Um, but I believe it's a false, it's a cybernetic, like you're gonna ascend into, I don't know, Jason, you had that that video, that MTV video of the, you know, whatever, kill the video, radio star. Video, video like, kill the radio a woman star. like dancing in the tube, like the magenta woman dancing in the tube. And I'm like, yeah, well, like, we'll think we're part of like Gaia and fulfilling our human potential. <laughs> we'll end up dancing in some clear damn tube, you know? <laughs> Oops, wait a minute, let me out. And that's actually a wrinkle in time. Like the dad is trapped in the tube, you know? Don't go in there too. It looks so fun. <laughs> and everything being based on like binary mathematics, which is how computer and so computers and software and transistors work. It's like a pretty yeah. obvious giveaway that you're not <laughs> you're not going into like unity. It's literally the opposite. So. Yeah. So that's that's all I wanted to say about that. And then Okay, and so this is, so I keep saying, so the Neil Stevenson books, again, like this guy, like he's knows the stuff, like his parents were high level scientists at Fort Meade, Maryland. And, you know, he, he's worked with Magic Leap VR and, and written these books in the early 90s, you know, coined the term the metaverse. And so I found an, an, an essay that was talking about, and maybe I should have thrown this up front, but this idea of life at the edge of chaos. And I'm, I'm and, 
essentially what what he's saying is that emergent behaviors in complexity theory and mathematical theory in these evolutionary algorithms happen at the, the, the tr phase transition between order and disorder. And that there is the exchange, there's the stability that's offered by the edge that provides um, the structure for the emergence of new potentialities, I guess. And so these people, again, like the MTA folks in, in Provo, they want to be creators. Like they want to be creating and catalyzing new um, developments. And, and I think weirdly that the, the sort of energetic economies that will be tied in with climate change and disaster and insurance products are ways for them to manage the game such as to achieve energy at the edges of these cybernetic circles and holons. So I'm just going to read a bit. They're talking like phase transition. It says it is at the edge of chaos between the highly ordered structures and randomly colliding molecules that we can expect to see living systems emerge from non-life mainly because this is where processes that can store and transmit information have the best chance to arise and gain a foothold. And so they're literally imagining life arising from information. Like that information itself will coalesce and become some sort of sentient thing with agency. And, and part of, you know, when I was doing some of my site visits, I went to, oh, I can't remember the name of school, like South Eastern Virginia University where Orson Scott Card is. And he had this thought process of phylotes and entanglement and pattern holding that the molecules like become complex enough that once they can hold their pattern, they start to coalesce as objects with agency, I guess. And so I think it's important to think about within the risk space, within the insurance space, within the stochastics and probability and statistics, and the idea that they're really working on, they're, they're advancing things called the donut economy, um, pods, you hear pods a lot, learning pods, house pods, that they're creating these artificial containment zones to generate the edges that they hope will maximize their opportunity to become the creators these cybernetic of cybernetic systems that they they want um in this phase transition and it's all computational though like so the life that comes out of it i mean you're right leo it's going to be limited by design because it it is coming out of computation out of information which has been stripped down of everything except for the binary encoding yeah it's taking all the like essence out of out of communication and um, yeah. exchange of, of energy yeah that's really interesting. so i don't know does any of that like i don't know if you guys were following what i was trying to like write the past two days but to me this feels like it's not yes they're gonna make money on these insurance things they're gonna control people with these things but ultimately behind the behind i think that they're using this concept of um managed crises uh uh, 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 steady states, uh, homeostasis, peace, uh, unity, harmony, because actually that harmony UBI, that's part of it, to, to, to lure us into this false sense of security and safety, to essentially give, a, give up all of the dynamism of the natural world, like all of the potential both scary and transcendent of the unknown, and give that up and then just walk into the circle and just stay on the inside of the circle. Yeah, I mean, anyway. I just, I agree. <laughs> I'm not sure if I have <laughs> anything that's coming to mind exactly. Oh yeah, that's a good, good timing. Yeah, did, so, where did, so where this, this is a little, um, yeah, so this is the Kavli Institute. I think in Norway, actually, it's one of their outposts in Norway. So the Kavli Institute is working on understanding the mind. Um, and I, I think this one might have actually been in Norway, but, and this is the fiction, like I was gonna sort of say this at the end, but I think this is the story that they wanna tell is that we have very fancy scientists who have all their credentials and they did the scientific experiment with rats and neural transmitters that could capture all of this brainwave activity. And they put them in three different environments. One was like free ranging, one was in a maze, and one was at sleep. 
and we they monitored all of the neural signals and then used some algorithm to crunch the numbers. And across all three scenarios, all of the rats always ended up forming a tor toroidal shape. So what they're saying is that you're trapped, like there's no way out of the toroidal shape. And to me, like what this is, is the, the, the rat running from through nature, like, but it's within the torus to the simulation, right? Like it's, it's the armature that, oh, you think you're in nature, but really this is just a simulation game. Um, and, and it's interesting because the rat itself is illuminated. And, and I think that there's something to this, like the photonic illumination. Although a lot of times when you see images of neuron transmission, they're always like blink, 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 like they have these lights. And you'll, you'll, you can see in the upper corner, there's the blockchain, right? There's the, the hexagon. Um, and it's interesting. I'm not sure what this signifies, but the edge, like a little pooch, like thing that comes out of it, like a explosion. Um, but when to me, like whenever you see that block, like you know that that's a blockchain block, that that's, that's to, you know, this is part of your mind file simulation program, um, you know, which, yeah, we're not files. <laughs> Let's just say that, like, we're, we're not files, people, <laughs> like, you know, we're not in that Taurus, actually. Like, if, if, if people imagine that they want you to think that that's all you are, is like something that is a rat running in a Taurus in a simulation and that you just upload it to the blockchain and then put it on a hard drive somewhere like that's the wrong story but that's the story that's being implanted like to me that's conjuring like that's Im imprinting a, f a future where we're all trapped as like a, a rat but they'll maybe let us feel like we're not quite in a maze they'll let us feel like it's natural and yet the, the ultimate result is the same but that's not that's not true <laughs> but that's the story that's being told anyway so i feel like that's the containment system for the cybernetic world well, what's funny is that this, that they thought that this was um, like something that would sell what they're doing. I don't <laughs> it seems to me like this is something your opposition would, would create to, to like warn people. <laughs> Pretty funny. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they don't expect it. a whole lot of people to imagine that they're, they're, they're at in the maze. And so like for me and Sephiroth has been doing this work too. So, and, and I want to say a lot of this work, Leo, like for, the stuff that I've been laying out, a lot of it is based on like the time I spent with your slide deck and getting acquainted with like the the the, the road that you are walking. And I've I've I'm sure I barely scratched the surface, but Jen Lake, which is Polio Forever, and Jen like WordPress, like I owe like just in terms of like if you want to know more, like there are people I'm just like baby stepping into the space and trying to apply it to what I know of the finance side, but um, like the the radio elements and sort of the climatic implications of the sort of the cold war fallout isotope tracking um you know the early radiology and crystallography you know that that i i really sort of you you and jen were that like the launching points for me on that and then steffers has also been doing a lot of work around the taurus and it, you know it's feeding into some of these new um Tomahawk or Tokamak, Tokamak reactors, nuclear, like new kinds of fusion reactors. And so I came across the donut economics, which is all part of the stakeholder capitalism construction, like the circular economy, right? The circle, we're going to have everything be circular. And again, I'm not saying that I want to be wasteful and I want to throw away culture and that, that I want um, to not be a good steward of the earth like that is that's not what i'm looking for but i think that the circular economy that they're selling people is inherently part of the nanotechnological panopticon control grid like it's it's a, it's a fake green it's a fake sustainability it's not authentic and they're framing it as a donut this thought leader kate raworth who is at like the world economic forum and so you know you have the society and then you have the ecology and so again it's man situated in the biosphere man in the biosphere people in nature because they, they need to control both parts and if you if you imagine if you go along with the story they tell themselves that at the edge they they have more potential to create new sort of emergent forms of life if you can herd everyone into the donut like not just a circle, like a donut is a double circle. 
a circle in a circle. You, you, you're not quite doubling the edge, but you've, you've got extra space in there. You know, you got more edge. And, you know, as I was placing this and thinking about the, um, the you know, the order from chaos, which is clearly like Masonic, right? Like that's, um, uh, you know, they that's what they always say, order from chaos. And even the, what do they say? Is the Ouroboros, like the snake holding its tail, the circle. Mm -hmm. um, that, that this is a very ancient imprinted concept. And when I was doing my site visit to MITRE Corporation and Northrop Grumman and Intelsat and MicroStrategies and Capital One, like when I was in that space, like, and I was in front of MITRE, which again is kind of like, it's a highly symbolic, like the hat, right? The MITRE. Um, I was in three circles that day. Like the, the display on that corner, and which is a public street, it was set back like it had a small little plaza maybe you know 15 by 15 not big and in it, it, the backdrop it had a vertical like their corporate logo but in the sidewalk space were three circles like and it was just low like with um a slight it was a cybernetic circle it looked like the cybernetic circles that we had seen with like a metal band and they were not quite parallel they were out of sync so they like you know if it was your washing machine it would be off kilter but you know someone on the live stream said i think i would get out of those circles if i were you <laughs> but it's in, it's an interesting imprint you know in in that space of like what the edge of the circle does and then the role of the economics <clears throat> in it that, that we are remaking social relationships and ecological relationships as a fictitious financial construct. I don't know. I've been getting, I've been getting junk mail exclusively from Capital One recently. Oh no. <laughs> George Overholzer oh, really wants know. you to like keep you happy Did with like some nice Sign up for 25% variable interest rate credit cards. <laughs> <Got good. laughs> I just like the ones that says you're approved to apply. <laughs> yes. You're <approved>. Yes. <laughs> Pretty funny. Chosen. Wow. You, you're the chosen one. So, so this, like when I was going back and looking at the, the, that first, like the coral reef bond and it being on the Yucatan, um, so again, so this is the, the, we're back to the coral reef, right? Complexity theory and risk and emergent life. Cause I think again, think about the, the richness of life in a coral reef. Like, I mean, that's an uneven edge. That's not a nice tidy circular edge, but they're looking for that, like that emergent richness of like that you would have in a, in a, um, a vital, you know, coral reef in a good ecosystem. And so it, it's in the Yucatan, you know, it was facilitated by the nature conservancy you know, and those all have ties to the World Wildlife Foundation and Swiss reinsurance is central to this. And it just so happens that, so this was happening in, um, oh gosh, yeah, Quintana Roo. So Quintana Roo is on, as I mentioned, the, the, the Cancun Cozumel side, but then opposite that on, on the peninsula there is the, um, the Chicxulub crater, is that, I don't know if that's how you say it, Chicxulub's crater, like, the giant asteroid meteor that crashed down and the story goes that that's what eliminated the dinosaurs like when it crashed mm -hmm. um and it, it actually is on the opposite side of that so it's it was the crater itself is partially on land and partially in the water and it's connected in a, like a karst cave-like system but the impact of that crater like of that collision the heat and the, it created a crystalline, like this very special crystalline form in that space with different kinds of water bubbling out around it. And a lot of this stuff was crystals and water, like an unlocking, you know, Stefford is doing more work in terms of like primary water and crystals because control of water is control of life. Surface water, control of surface water is control of life. And that's what they need to keep everyone under control. So I, I just wanted to situate this geographically that it's, it's in a significant location, this particular coral reef deal. Okay. Yeah, that does seem significant. I didn't quite put that together about the location. Before. Yeah. And so someone just, and this is the synchronicity stuff. Um, so yesterday, actually uh, Eve, who did the great zine, she sent me a slightly updated version of the zine. And she's like, what? and I think she's in Florida. She's like, oh, you probably know that the Miami Smart City Conference is coming up 
or whatever, you probably know some of the people. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, well, let me look and see. You know, there's a bazillion of these smart city things all over the place, but it's in Miami. It's it's in two weeks, September 14th and 15th at the Miami Beach Convention Center. And who is going to be there? Well, Mauricio uh, Villa Dosal, who happens to be the governor of the state of Yucatan, is going to be there. So along with NIST, the Connected Systems Division, and then also the, the mayor of Denver. So I feel like, again, these, these systems are interconnected like in regional global ways, and they're all networking. Like these guys know what's coming down. Like they, they, know, they know the deal. San Mexico is where and, they in did Miami a lot of and blockchain. Oh, I was just gonna say, like, is so interconnected with Latin America, like that's the the door, and it's such a blockchain heavy city. Do you want to? Um, you can go, Le uh, Leo. Do you want to explain what a, what the uh, catastrophic bond is? Yeah. So, uh, catastrophe bonds. So, are yeah. Sorry, I said. Wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not close enough. Parametric insurance products that ensure they're generally done with like states or countries or cities that ensure them from like natural disasters usually uh, volcanoes hurricanes earthquakes flood uh, i saw one or yeah those sorts of things and they were mostly pretty much developed by the world bank in the early 2000s like late 90s and start were first being like tested and implemented. There was like a mix of, I think they essentially, the World Bank like subsidized a lot of the early catastrophe bonds and like had these, had these uh, countries like Caribbean nations and Mexico take up these products. And it's parametric in the sense that say a hurricane, you had a catastrophe, catastrophe bond ensuring you against hurricane if the hurricane met a certain threshold of like wind speeds, then the insurance claim would automatically kick in and the, the country would get a certain amount of money based on the threshold it reached instead of, like I mentioned earlier, instead of the insurance companies assessing property damage and then basing claims based off of that. Um, so that's... The kind of basics. I just found out actually this morning that the first like hurricane catastrophe modeling was created by this woman, Karen Clark, out of Boston. And she created, and they ended up making a company called Air Worldwide that was bought by V Risk based out of Jersey City, which is like this massive. Yeah. Um, you probably know about them. I had like just learned this morning, like software modeling and uh good all this sort of stuff they have like eight thousand employees i'm sure they do all sorts of stuff and they own some other another company i thought was really interesting in lex based in lexington massachusetts where they called atmospheric environmental research that was started in the 70s and doing like working with NOAA, the DOD, a lot of the like early advanced uh, weather satellite monitoring and all that sort of stuff. So it seemed like there was kind of this consolidation around. Um, I have or this relationship. I'm mm -hmm. oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I was just gonna say, like the photochemistry, like that, like one of those in terms of the atmospheric, it was like photochemistry. So it was like light based. Yeah, like chemical effects of light which makes a lot of sense, but I just never even occurred to me that it was actually a thing and that that's what they that's were using to sort of like model. Yeah, I know, but I guess, I don't know, somehow it felt like when I see photochemistry and you think about, yeah, light, I mean, I guess we all know that a light affects us, whether it's natural light or fluorescent light or LED light, but so much of the climate narrative, right, is being framed around ma light management. Right, managing darkness, managing lightness, managing the kind of lightness. I mean, I'm still trying to puzzle out the degree to which like smart street lights are a key part of this like optogenetics and influence, like wave based influence in photonics of of living systems or how it's going to be activated through photonics because 
I, I can't see them putting so much money into all of this light-based infrastructure in smart cities with it just simply being energy efficiency. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's kind of wild. wild these, these lights are like kind of brutal. Like when you drive, like, you know, you look at them and it's like, it's really harsh on the eyes. Like, I don't know if you guys have noticed that, but it's like, I really do not like them at all. Cause I just, it, it, if you look, if you even like look anywhere near them, it's, it's almost like it Thank interrupts you. it, like interrupts your, it, like it actually interrupts your, your focus. Really? It's wild. Huh. It's weird. I'm not I would say they started that. adding all these LED lights in Philly and it looks like Blade Runner. It looks like bad Blade Runner. Like I look at the skyline and I'm like, because, you know, we're not that far off the skyline, our house. And, and it just they've added all of these extra bits of light, like for accent. But it's none of it makes you feel good. It, it's, it's jarring. So. I agree. Yeah, I just added this slide with the cat bond about and it's, it's interesting that it's Mexico because. You know, again, Mexico is ge geologically very active, right? Like on the faults and the hurricanes. So it's quite a target for these um, products. And this was, yeah, like early 2000s. Wait, did yeah, you? Yeah, 2006 say was the first uh, parametric bond in me the Mexican. So I don't know if that was the one. This is yeah, that was, to. yeah. I, I guess it's I a report was. modeling the risk. Okay. Allison, did you get this from yeah. the the paper I, I posted like earlier today, or did you? I, I think this? so. Yeah, I just grabbed. Oh, okay, one. I was like, wow, that's crazy. There. Like you had it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you posted it. I was kind of thinking, yeah, Jason, cool. when you're like, could you talk about cap bonds? I'm like, I think I have a slide about that. <laughs> but um, yeah. but the thing is, like, I think the other piece is is that Mexico is essentially a test bed for so much of this, and you know, I I did all of that deep work into the conditional cash transfers. And once you realize, like, those are things that can be manipulated, you can manipulate economic situations. And, like, ultimately, like, we know that at least they say that they, they have the capacity to manipulate weather systems, you know, and there, there's been a lot of conjecture about tectonic weapons, right? And so, you know, they're not going to come right out and say if they have, if they actually have tectonic weapons, but, um, you know, if, if you know how to frack things, I mean, like, how hard is it that you, you imagine that they have, like, with all the directed energy that you, you don't have some way of, like, again, I'm not saying maybe you make it up out of nothing, but if you have an unstable area that you could, like, tip this, put your finger on the scale a little bit and, like, weigh it down. I, I mean, once you start to play games with this amount of money, it's hard to imagine that that wouldn't happen. So, um, so Mexico feels very vulnerable and... You know, the, the reality is, is many of the elite that run the governments, like they're educated up here, right? They go to Yale, they do these things and then they get trained here and then they get sent back to essentially, you know, do what the network tells them to do. At least well, they did with the conditional transfer. That's what's crazy about these parametric uh, catastrophe bonds is just this, you're, you're incentivizing a situation that there actually is the ability to um manipulate <laughs> you know yeah totally <laughs> crazy and at the bottom there air worldwide corporation is the it's the one i just mentioned earlier and from at least as of june 2022 they apparently are at least listed as a modeler for 70 percent of all catastrophe bonds out there and I kind of, I guess I sort of forgot to mention this earlier, but with with these catastrophe bonds and parametric insurance, there's always a third party verifier that the the trigger oh. event was actually met, and that's that's these companies, these sort of modeling agencies that are doing the machine learning and all that sort yeah. of stuff. And the one that I had written about before is Mitiga Solutions, which we'll get to. Well, an Oracle, you know, they call them oracles or whatever, but like that's what you know, looking into chain link, that's yep. a, lo a lot of what they do is finding these trusted third parties to collect and verify the information, um, you know, the data, make yeah, sure exactly. to claim that it's in like a s smart contract world, there would be an Oracle system that connects to like air worldwide, and they would get the information from them. And then that would trigger the smart contract. And yeah, yeah, well, 
And in my defense, by the way, on the slides, uh, Allison was adding slides right up to the very <laughs> last minute. <laughs> No, I didn't mean it in a mean way. I just didn't want to interrupt you and be like, I, I couldn't remember where I'm it was. I'm about to talk so about that. <laughs> no worries. No, that's fine. Well, you know, with, with a lot of this information, I think it's good for us to hear it more than one time. I mean, I know I need to hear it more than one time for it to like, oh, okay, that's what that is. You know, I heard that before, but I didn't know what that was. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is the other tricky thing. So there's um, like I have a little map on the upper right of like the peninsula. So the red line is the coastal area with the coral reef bond. Okay. And then on the flip side is, um, I don't know if it's Merida, Merida um, is the city. That's the circle is like where the asteroid crater that killed the dinosaurs is. Like, so that's a very significant energetic space, right? Like if you're going to pick a energetic geography, like on the globe, like that would be it. And in fact, like the, um, the cathedral, the San Ildefonso's Cathedral of Merida, I think is the first cath Catholic cathedral in the new world. So they knew it. And I think it's built on Mayan ruins actually. So there's a lot of energetics going on in that area. Like, and again, it's not exactly in the coral reef, but it's in that proximity. And being <laughs> in consideration of all of the work, like that Jason and I are gradually building up about um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and their investments and their technology interests, um, there's a temple, a relatively new, I think it was like late 1990s. Um, Mexico has the second largest population of members of that church um, after the US. And then it's like US, Mexico, Brazil. And there's a lot of tourism that's specifically spiritual tourism in, uh, in, in that part of the world because they're, um, the, the Book of Mormon talks about things happening and they believe that that's the region. So when people take sort of spiritual tourism trips, a lot of them, like there's a small group that a smaller group of people who imagine that that those things happened in Ohio. And then it's more popular that people think it happened in Central America and the Mayan ruins. And so if you are planning a vacation to, to go do spiritual tourism, like, would you want to go to Dayton or would you want to go to Cancun? Like they go to Cancun, right? And so there's a huge, um, like, it's not exclusive, like clearly, like there's many tourists, but it's, it's a destination. And like the Marriott family is a very prominent LDS family and their brand, like they have 30 brands. There's like 30 different hotel interests, like along that coral reef. <laughs> so it's very interesting to me because the, the, the church is actually very deeply into the insurance markets and into, I think, even catastrophe, catastrophe bonds. And so they would have a very direct actual connection to the economic outcomes of those coral reefs in that particular locale. Like it's a very interesting overlay of interest. Um, and the other thing that I had found out was that it says that um, yeah, so the the newly formed state. So this state of uh, Quintana Roo is not that old. It says it's 1974. So again, there's not a long history there. And that Cancun was the first master planned resort. And so whenever I see sort of master planning, like that's the human resource aspect that I imagine. Like, again, they're not planning a, a cooperative or a kibitz or something. They're, they're master planning a resort, but maybe it's more along the lines of Jason, what you've looked in for Epcot. But like, there's considerable interest in developing in very specific ways that geography. And it overlaps with the interest of the LDS church, which I find compelling. So I don't know. Did you find like that master. interesting? Like I was just finding that last night. <laughs> yeah, it's super interesting. I don't know so much about LDS, but that kind of reminded me one of the founders of Cello, whose name I can't pronounce, um, his dad was or grandfather or great grandfather somewhere in there was one of the main planners for Singapore, like UN commission. Oh, wow. Like, uh, yeah, like planners for building the city state. And that just reminded me of that when you mentioned King. Oh, it's what you funny mentioned. Well, you know, again, like, oh, I was just oh. gonna say, like, we went to that conference in March because it was about blockchain, like literally. And this is, I guess what I'm trying to link is 
it was blockchain across the board in all sorts of ways, like from relationships to religion, to salt nuclear reactors, to, uh, yeah. you know, whatever, Haber Georgianism or whatever, like it was all of these different ways of integrating blockchain, which to me feels like the Frankenstein stuff. Like it feels like the creator stuff. And once you realize that the human genome project came out of the Salt Lake City area, once you realize that very high level technology is there, that the first virtual object was developed at University of Utah, once you know like the role of BYU and digital identity and the NSA, I mean, it it feels anyway. There's a, there, it feels significant to me, like not just coincidental that they both ha would have financial interests, um, but um, s symbolic interests, and that by creating a more like financial instruments that would advance further blockchaining of the environment, continue to advance this, you know, human plus program. What's well, it's, it's funny? Yeah, they're they're. Their conference, and you can if you can go to their YouTube channel. It's uh, Mormon Transhumanist Association. Their YouTube, and you can look, you can actually watch all the the talks that they gave. And yeah, it was like on a lot of different topics that might not seem like necessarily connected, um, at least directly. And I know I I sent one of your articles to someone recently, Allison, and they were like, "Oh, I hope she comes up with a with a." Um, with a hypothesis or whatever that that connects all these disparate things, you know, and and it does. If you read through it, it does appear like these are a whole bunch of things that like are you know disconnected. But you know, you have to if you spend some time with it, you realize that they actually there is a there is a through line. It's just not always immediately apparent. <laughs> Taming the spiral, their attempt to tame the spiral. It's not going to work, I don't think. So here you go, Leo. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, okay. I didn't mean to so, hog up all this stuff. <laughs> no, you're good. So this is uh, a diagram just I got from the, we should get the, the links are in the description, I think, but um, comparing parametric insurance to traditional insurance. And if I've mentioned a couple of times, like, the trigger event, you know. So in traditional insurance, the insurers are assessing the loss or damage to property values or to the the thing that's being insured. With parametric solutions, there's there's none of that. There's not you don't assess the loss. There's just a predetermined amount that will be paid out from a predetermined trigger event, and they sometimes tier it so there'll be different thresholds. Like say if uh, the volcano, the one that I wrote my article about was a volcano catastrophe bond. And the, the trigger event was the height of the ash plume from an eruption, but the, it was tiered. So if the height plume got to a certain height, this a certain amount would be paid out and then more and more if the plume was bigger. So they, they kind of like do it like that. Uh, Why are they bringing a bunch of blowers up on the mountain? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. see, the thing is, well, like, what fans. if you write the contract? Like, what if the contract is for the plume? Only what happens is, is that the earth opens up at the bottom, and then the lava just flows all out of the village, and there's no ash. And they're like, "Oh, sorry, man." Like, yeah, sorry. Ash, you know? like, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I guess they could have they could have they could have fans from above blowing down. You know, <laughs> there's lots of ways to do that. Yeah, there's there's lots of uh, opportunity for manipulation and. Um, yeah, and I guess part of like what those people would probably respond to that, or I mean, they can't respond to a lot of the criticism, but generally parametric insurance has been kind of framed as supplementary for the most part to larger financial planning for states and uh, countries and stuff. It's not sold as like, this is this is how you're going to protect yourself against all things. It's sort of like a smaller niche thing, but it is is growing quite a bit. Um, and I guess this part basis risk. Uh, I'd have a hard time exactly articulating what they mean by basis risk, but essentially the risk of 
uh, loss for the insurer of whatever it is, whether it's property or whatnot. And in traditional insurance, that's all kind of in the fine print on like what what they're exposing themselves to and how they do it and how much value is at stake and whatnot. With parametric, it's kind of because uh, it's all about the data and all about the modeling and the likelihood that data that the data that's going to be fed in will reach that that three predetermined threshold. Um, so it's like it's it's kind of an insurance. If you're creating an insurance policy for the metaverse, like that's what it would be based off of data. So. Wow. Well, yeah, and then it and allows then, the per permanent surveillance of everything and exactly. feeding that like, again, you know, I keep thinking about the environmentalist movement, right? Like there, there are real costs, energetic costs to store this data, to collect it, whatever. I mean, they're coming up with new ways of like trying to, you know, alternative ways of powering the stuff and storing the data. But like, imagine you have sensor networks that are just constantly waiting and recording to see if some trigger event happens for years on end. <laughs> like, where does all that, like, exactly. I don't know how it works. Like, do they erase it at the end of the month? Like when the thing didn't happen or does it just build up? Because I think it's this it, it, vast data store that they're developing for the pattern recognition. Like that's what exactly. they're seeking. It's, is like, the, it's all the machine overall. learning. They want to know the cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all. It's constantly the data is constantly refining the models, and it's all, it's all cloud based. Like with the Microsoft Planetary Computer, that's uh, Azure. Uh, yeah, Azure is their. I think they're like their broad cloud solution, but they're building oh, okay. like a planetary computer thing, which is basically a planetary digital twin and other sorts of software products for doing environmental monitoring and this sort of thing. Um, have you come across anything in this space that deals that's kind of similar to like shorting? Yeah, so with with all of these contracts, they get securitized, and that's part of the reinsurance process is bundling them into different securities, and then they're traded on like securities exchanges. And there's different ways that hap how that happens. The 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 catastrophe bond with the Danish Red Cross they wrote about. The firm that was securitizing mm. it is called Replexus, and they were they're based in Guernsey. I don't know how to say it. It's an island between uh, Britain and France that has, is Guernsey. kind of like a ba Guernsey is a basis for a lot of where a lot of insurance companies are incorporated in. And they had a blockchain. They basically created like a proprietary blockchain, like a closed blockchain system for the trading of the the securitized catastrophe bonds. Um, so yeah, you can short it. You can do all the you know various types of trades and derivatives. And I'm not super well versed in how like. So this was an image. Works. I grabbed this image off the Guernsey website. I don't know if you guys can oh. what? can see that, but this was on the Gur. I was what? I was. I, I went to their website, the Guernsey. So you ILS, that's the, on his cape, the yeah. ILS. That stands for Insurance Linked Securities, which is collateralized insurance. What? But they're like these superheroes. And there's like these like... I didn't know what the magenta and like... That's really crazy. What is that? Yeah, I found this that this is... morning. I was like, oh, I got to grab that. <laughs> you totally Wait. have to grab that. Where was it? like Whoa. on the website of the like government there? Or... Is it the insurance like? <laughs> well, the GIIA, I think it's the Guernsey. Guernsey's website. They have like a conference coming up actually, um, <laughs> and this was like the advertise like it was on the top of the advertisement for their conference. Well, see, it was like a sailboat in the let in me, the tornado. Let me see if I can find. <laughs> <laughs> but interesting like look like the spiral but this it's a spiral of destruction like the spiral is being framed as a destruct like a solely destructive force which is interesting it's like it's run away from the spirals and get in our nice lasers. circle <laughs> yeah and they have the volcano in the back that's definitely a reference to yeah. the catastrophe bond because it's, it's the first it was the it, first uh, volcano catastrophe i'll have bond. to find that link because i i deleted it 
but um, it was off of something that one of I think one I think something you posted. It was I followed a link that kind of like, or maybe I just searched at something. I'll I'll find it again and send you the because Guernsey's the island. There's an island. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's it, but it's also like uh, yeah. But they have a conference coming up, so we should we should, we should go. <laughs> Wow. And it's interesting because like it does feel like water is a, a key piece. I mean, I know Steffers has been doing is pulling together stuff about managed water and like wastewater, ocean water, fresh water, drought, pumping, like the con control of the water wars is gonna be a really significant part of um and I'm 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 sure they'll have all sorts of catastrophe bonds related to drought. As well. Yeah, I, I just read one about it was a Swiss re insurance product about the river heights. So about if the river for like transportation. So if the river goes down to a certain level, then that would be the payout because it would disrupt like the commercial vessels and stuff. And they called it flow. So I found the website. Uh, let me just throw it up here. This is the website. So they have a conference. Uh, this is actually a different oh. image. I didn't see this one. Thursday. Oh, that's an older conference. Uh, but they have another one coming up. Uh, wow. Anyway. It looks really destructive. It all looks really... It looks like, like, we don't yeah, want to build a world that runs on disaster. <laughs> like, the, can we just all agree that shouldn't be a hard a hard thing conclusion to draw right <laughs> so, yeah. let's just not let's just not do this so yeah it wouldn't let me click on stuff because i have it as an overlay but anyways it's it's okay. we are guernsey.com is the website we are guernsey and it's g-u-e we're on fire <laughs> we have tornadoes <laughs> yeah. Come, you want to bet laser, laser modified eyes <laughs> <laughs> and I think the last thing I would say from this slide is that parametric insurance because of the kind of clear trigger metrics and the like data heavy emphasis is like kind of built for automation and smart contracts and that sort of yeah. thing, which we'll get into right now. So, so this is just like a simple diagram about how oracles work. Um, so basically oracles are just a layer interface between like traditional web servers, really any sort of data source that is considered to be like that they, usually they predefine what sources are considered like valid um, and then having that information be used by smart contracts on the blockchain because the blockchain can't just like say like read the, the prices on the New York Stock Exchange or something like there needs to be some yeah. sort of software intermediary to make that work to have the smart contracts read it and that's what oracles are um, at a basic level. And there's kind of they're kind of their own in some ways. They they run on a lot of the same game theory that blockchain does. So in Chainlink, in a lot of Chainlink systems, the oracles have to stake like the token, the Chainlink token, and then get paid certain amounts based on their performance and that they, you know, push the data from the servers that they said that they, they will. In a lot of cases, those oracles sign like actual legal, like service level agreements with, um, like the DAO involved or, or some other like foundation or, or party in, involved in the smart contract system. So there's it's not it's not just um, a lot of these oracles are basically just like regular business relationships in a lot of ways. It's not as a, like esoteric as it may seem. And a web with web, it says web servers there, but a lot of that could be like IOT devices, really any sort of internet connected device um, or straight from the satellites or from the organizations that 
model all the data data from the satellites and whatnot. Can I ask a question, Leo? And I'm not sure yeah. if you know how this works, but um, like ultimately as augmented reality becomes more robust, like there's more sensors, there's more engagements. It seems to me that they're probably gonna come up with sensor networks that are like low power requirement, or maybe just are activated in proximity when there's like a trip, like it senses there's some other device nearby that it needs to engage with, mm -hmm. you know, like that it would just rest. Like it would probably be at a low energy state at some point until it has to like pop yeah. up and like do something because they don't want to power all this stuff that really is this edge distributed, like low power, but that totally. people would need to have an interface with the web three. And that's either through a wearable or eventually maybe that's an implantable aspect. Like, so that when yeah. you walk up to the sensor, it can identify you and know how to transact. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering, do you think like the oracles would be embedded in a wearable or would it be up in the cloud somewhere? Like, so the, how, the, the, the wearable, the wearables would, it would probably happen in like a number of different ways, but basically the wearables would be in the place of the web server block on these slides. So the oracle, okay. the, the wearables would, be sending data to the oracles okay. and then the oracles would okay. be triggering the smart contracts. Um, but there'd probably okay. be like intermediaries in there, like probably the data from the wearable would be aggregated into some other like, you know, data service. Cause it's probably some sort of like pretty complicated thing going on. And then that would be communicated to the Oracle network, but yeah. Yeah. I found this little clip that might help. I maybe I'll run it real quick, and I hopefully I have it queued up in the right spot. I'm kind of eyeballing it, so forgive me if it's not. But let me. This is from Chainlink, actually. That's when we get to Oracles. And Oracle is a trusted third party that gives you reliable data outside the current information that you have access to. See, back in medieval times, an Oracle was a person who could use their crystal ball to see into the future, essentially giving reliable information to someone who wanted it. Whether you believe in that stuff or not, when it comes to blockchains, they want the same thing. See, a blockchain cannot see outside of its own code. It can't go searching around the internet and and it can't even ask for more information. It's simply coded to store data and transactions, like I mentioned in the beginning. However, we can write smart contracts in a way that they rely on third-party information, like the price of a stock, the temperature outside, or even who won the presidential election. The Oracle can act as a middleman between the blockchain and the real world. Also, one thing I want to clarify here, Oracles aren't real things. They're usually just code programmed by someone and trusted by a lot of people. So there is no real physical oracle out there. It's kind of like the internet. We can all use it and we kind of know what it is, but it's not really one thing. For the rest of this- All right. Anyway, so a little-, little... Yeah, I think that that, that that was definitely helpful and probably clearer than what I said. I think at the, the, what they said at the end though, I don't think is really true. They're, they're not like, they're, they're, they're computers. They're like a node run by someone. Like someone has yeah. to run the software. So that might be a lot of it's probably done in a cloud environment, but it's still like being maintained by someone, especially with the weather related ones. It's usually like a weather station out somewhere. Would right, and they horrible. pay them. They they'll pay them in like tokens in order to like reward them, and that's kind. Of, isn't exactly. that kind of like the stake of uh, you know like they get to you know stake? Yeah, they they have they have to stake. Usually they have to stake some amount of the token. And then if they don't meet certain uh, like performance like requirements, which is basically if they don't like keep putting in the data that they say they're going to, then they'll lose some of their stake. So it's a financial incentive to make them behave a certain way, which is the basis of how blockchains work. Uh, anyways, especially in proof of stake. And then they also get rewarded for if they do it right. And with for a lot of them, like with Declimate, we we're talking about earlier, uh, the DAO, the the DAOs that control the smart contracts will choose what oracles they want to use for their smart contracts. So they'll kind of define a predetermined set 
of oracles that have the authority to trigger those smart contracts. Um, and that's managed through the DAO. But yeah, so this diagram right here, we're, so where I was talking about earlier that you don't actually need smartphones for, for a lot of these for people to use. And that's this program USSD, which I forget what it stands for exactly, but primarily through SAFRICOM, which is a telecommunications provider that, uh, if I remember correctly, is owned by a larger French, or used to be owned by a larger, like multinational French telecommunications company. But the farmers can just, okay, I'll back up for a second. For a lot of how the insurance products that are being sold to small scale farmers, they're actually like wrapped into the buying of seeds and like fertilizer and that sort of thing and is a part of the, like the, the supplier will just like bundle the insurance into that. And oftentimes it's free. So they, they make it basically as like trying to make it as easy as possible. And I don't think they really sell like these insurance products by themselves generally. Interesting. And then, yeah, when they when they're bundled up, they're, you know, I don't know exactly how it works, but essentially they have they get certain codes that they can text on the USSD system that tells them the status of their insurance agreement, and then when the certain metrics are hit, like rainfall, if there's not enough rain they can check and then see if they the the payout occurred. And so, yes, yeah, this diagram is showing, the text, the data is put into the blockchain, and then that money bag on the bottom, this part is one of the big reasons that these insurance tech companies are really interested in smart contracts is that it's a lot easier for them to pool capital uh, like pool risk is the other way they would put it to supply these insurance products. They can just get it from the blockchain. There's a lot of capital out there and it's constantly growing and they can then create all, they can integrate all the various financial smart contracts and applications that already exist out there into these insurance products. So just, you know, trying to make as much money as possible and Um, yeah, basically the data triggers whether the pool of capital is paid out to the farmer. And I feel like this diagram actually isn't as good as I would hope, but I mean, it's, it's basically describing the same stuff that we've talked about a few times now on how parametric insurance works and that the data that trig that triggers the payout gets fed into smart contracts and smart contracts are the tool that will automatically send the money to the farmer. And then since like they're on a flip phone, it's, it's intermediated by the telecommunications company essentially is how that works from how I understand USSD. It's the, 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 telecommunications company runs a server that's connected to the internet and basically just uh, inter is the intermediary there. And Can I chime in? One of the things, of oh, course. I just wanted to say, um, like on the fertilizer stuff, because we've talked about that a bit later about, I mean, they have this sort of the new synthetic biology fertilizer that's like activated at the roots or you, I don't know if it's technically remotely activated by by certain conditions like the, yeah. the, the next phase is going to be sort of nanotechnology based framed as bio and organic you know they're gonna they're gonna tell a story that all of these synthetic things because they're made out of molecules <laughs> you know some kind of molecule that this is like so much better than chemicals and I can see like in the narrative that the way they talk about nitrogen fertilizer, which I'm not saying is great, but like they're they're costing it out so you can imagine a transition. Like they're gonna phase the transition from nitrogen into these more targeted synthetic biology fertilizers. So when you were talking about like how it's packaged in with the seed, 
And I can imagine some of these fertilizers come with their own nanoparticulate like sensor networks. Like it's interesting to think about how the pullback off of the old nitrogen based fertilizers, which, you know, prior to that was guano, prior to that was like more small scale, you know, you couldn't have industrial scale agriculture that you had to have smaller plots that were like actually self sustaining. Um, you know, how that might end up feeding into the parametrics or the sensor networks, because like, how are they going to know about the rain, right? Like, unless they come up with like, because I don't know, I yeah, hear it's right now, it's just it's it rains, it rains everywhere. But like in New Mexico, it could it could rain a whole lot one place and one block over then the rain isn't there. So they're going to need mm -hmm. a really granular level to run these deals, I think. And I, I can I can see it being woven into the seed like here's your seed and here's our new fertilizer and we're doing pay for success finance with the nitrogen offset and we packaged your bit of insurance in it too you know definitely it's, it's so tricky yeah right now as as far as i understand they basically are just using like local weather stations is how they do okay. it they it's not super granular but with a lot of the insurance companies and i think and Google and the large scale uh, G like GIS mapping firms, they can get, you know, they have pretty high resolution for a lot of these things, like less, like a kilometer <laughs> or less. And like, you know, so I, I, I think, a, think lot, about a, it. a lot of it will really be satellite based and remote. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's true. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Um, real quick, okay, uh, before you. In. Before you go on to this next one, I have to step away for just a minute. I will be right back. Uh, carry on, and uh, I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, we, well, we, let's, we, let's just let's let's all yeah, just I take. Could, I could, yeah, let's just take a break. I Everyone, we're just gonna all take a break. We'll we'll be back uh, shortly. <laughs> Five minutes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, you know what I can do? I can give you guys. Um, I'll just leave you with this. We'll be back. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you guys we'll with this lov lovely image. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I bet you guys are sick of that image. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. So I, I snuck a little slide in between Leo. I just thought this was like trying to convey like the, the how the machine reads the space, like in the smart contract. <laughs> like it is something that it's important for people to start wrapping their heads around because just like our sensory apparatus is limited by like has limitations of what we are able to perceive the way the machine like perceives is also different. Like it's a different level of perception that involves coding and artificial vision. So like as all of these smart contracts proceed, like the idea of the artificial vision and the machine seeing trees, seeing people, seeing stuff as part of this semantic web and the web is all of this like metadata, layers of metadata. And I can imagine that while the sensor networks are building this simulation, like they're like the, the granularity and the big data analytics of built like living environments will all more and more refined. Like, I don't know how much within an augmented reality layer you'll see, like when you walk up to a tree and you have on your whatever augmented visual things like will you know the health of that tree or be able to pull up pictures like every five years of that you know like how how much of the recording system of this artificial vision and monitoring is going to be embedded and just even rethinking of it like the world that way people i don't think people are equipped to even imagine that that's the kind of layers that are being built and what it might look like i don't know do you guys think that's worthwhile? Like the cyber physical yeah. part of it, like the, just the semantic web, like how we think about the world is changing. Definitely. I Absolutely. mean, yeah, I'm not sure. It's hard to know how it's gonna play out exactly. And, yeah. But but if we're, we're going to justify it in terms of disaster management, right? We're going to, we've already mm -hmm. been conditioned for the past 10 years. We're living in a potential disaster area. Every day you wake up, the end of the world could come. Like some terrible thing is going to happen. Like that's the news cycle. 
And so that that preconditions you to feel like, well, we have to live in the panopticon, otherwise there's no safety. And I guess what I'm trying to say is like, if you have a different lens, actually those stories, like we don't necessarily have to live in their bad stories. I'm not saying to be dismissive of like actual concerns about the environment or poverty or things, but like, I don't know that we wanna live in the story that they're trying to tell, like in, in capture us in, cause it's that rat story. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd say one thing that for sure will be embedded and is already happening is the like trees role in the larger like web of ecosystem services and like quantified monetary value that it's a part of so and those like accounting standards are have recently been set by the un's like statistical divisions on how they're going to do like their international standards for this ecological like biodiversity accounting and how it'll come down to each tree and how each tree does has, sequesters this much carbon and respires this much air and all that sort of thing. And I feel like that will likely be embedded. I'm not sure how green, like if you'll be able, like with your like smart glasses or whatever, like see it, yeah. but that that will definitely be- Your iPad a or whatever. Part of it. <laughs> yeah, it'll definitely be a part of the tree's identification at some, on some level, whether it's just seen in a forest or if they get down to every tree, which they probably could pretty quickly. I mean, satellite. the thing that I found so devastating in the last piece that I wrote was like looking at this Green New Deal atlas. I mean, and these people are so fraudulent, right? They're experts and yet literally like the equations that they're creating, the stories they're telling are that like by 2060, 90% of the United States is supposed to be covered in forest. And, and I'm assuming they mean forest, like not a scrub, like, so what they're talking about is ecocide, right? Like that's actually ecocide of any sort of non-forest system. And to me, like then there's a huge conversation that ha happened to say like, who, who is it whose power to remake the environment in this way in the name of like averting disaster or, you know, the, the carbon sequestration. It's, it, it would be catastrophic because there's great beauty in desert landscapes, in prairie landscapes, in Arctic lands. Like, I don't even know, like there's no water to grow trees on 90%. Like, how would that even happen unless they tap into their primary water stuff and then they make it public? But like, it, it, there's so many inconsistencies in the climate narrative. And I keep hoping that eventually, you know, people who truly do care about the environment and making things right will start to recognize that this mechanical, like sent semantic web version of financial derivatives in nature is just such a terrible idea. Well, and the yeah, thing and, I think and, about with like even the parametric insurance is just, this is all about protecting and, and expanding financial interests, you know? Yeah. And so it, it's, yeah, that's a, anyway, go yeah, ahead. Sorry, it's a, yeah. It's just a bit, I, I feel like that's something I haven't quite, cause it really ties into like the monetary stuff that you talk about a lot is that, by creating these ecosystem services and biodiversity values that can be insured through parametric insurance is it, it, it's creating money out of nothing. Like before they didn't have when like a financial value for, for a tree besides once it was actually commodified, but just now they're creating a financial system where they're creating money and creating debt instruments and secure and securities and derivatives on top of all this stuff, it's like complete, just like alchemy money made up yeah. stuff, um, which is a huge part of. And I, I keep thinking, and I might be a bit like, I'm not sure if I'm right, but it feels like this would be the logic of it is that the, the chemo taxonomy or the chemo taxonomy, like the idea of taking the t taxonomy down to a molecular level and the idea that like the new the new profit, like the actual is connected to molecular design, right? Synthetic biology, and that you go prospecting by sampling, right? And these samples could be very small. Like there was a woman that I talked to who said like someone in her family who really cared about the environment, but they were trying to deal with like the fungus on the bats or whatever. And so they, they took a blood draw of all these bats. And like that's value in a molecular engineering standpoint. Like all of a sudden now they have a database of like tens of thousands of bats communities. Like that, like that's yeah. prospecting. And they don't actually have to kill the bat to get 
the data to feed into the simulation, but you can create this fictitious constructs. Like you could bioprospect a whole ecosystem through chemo taxonomy and put all the molecular potentiality into a simulation and leave, except for maybe slightly disrupted the stuff and then, and then call it a day and say, you've, you've made all of these resources for this new, you know, fraudulent, yeah. like system of construction, like fabric. In like the pharmaceutical industry, they've been doing that for a long time with plants jungle yeah. and all that, the bioprospecting and creating synthetic versions of it, patent, all that. Yeah. Well, I, I see how people, f you know, fall for it, though, because there's a logic to it. You know, we have to save the economy. Like none of us, you know, I had someone the other day say, you know, like, you know, if it weren't for the system, basically, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be able to eat. You wouldn't have a roof over your head. So there's that logic of like, if I don't have money, I can't. I can't survive, um, but it's 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 hard for people to, to step outside of that to say, well, maybe there's a different arrangement. You know, wouldn't it's not like we're gonna get there overnight, but maybe maybe yeah. we you know exactly. we're, we're in a trap and we need to like step back and think about that and and how do we overcome that? But it's just like oh, it's a given. We gotta we gotta we gotta protect. We gotta save the economy. We gotta stop the next two thousand eight crash or whatever. Um, you know, aside from the fact that they're not actually trying to do that. I mean, that's a separate <laughs> issue, but it, you know, even if they were, it's, it's, it's problematic. <laughs> yeah. It's like cello and it's a big part of like the sustainable web three narratives is it's like they're making money beautiful. It's like, Oh, we have yeah. to incorporate, we're incorporating the natural world into the monetary system. And that's the heart <laughs> of the, the pathology of imperialism and colonial mindset so finally tr take into account nature <laughs> trees finally have a seat at the table at the board you know at the boardroom table we're gonna finally let trees have a seat <laughs> yeah literally so they'll be um and so and i was just like I, I thought that this this was connected to, to that as well, like the semantic web. It, it, it describes it as a path through a labyrinth of data. And so this is another like imprinting that Steffers has been looking at. Like, in, and I even like came into the labyrinth idea early on around the idea of the Minotaur and Wall Street and sort of Mithraic, like this this engagement, at least with pay for success that, that we were engaging with Wall Street, like in the labyrinth. But, um, like the computers have to have structured information. Like literally we are remaking the world to make it machine readable so that the machine can rule us <laughs> like that. And we're doing it in the name of safety yeah. and stability and, 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 and the idea of automated reasoning. So th the machines don't know anything, like everything that the machine can do, we actually have to teach it. Like, I mean, eventually it's gonna start to aggregate build itself, but like at the baseline, all of the data that we're feeding in, all of the patterns, all of the coding, we're, we are literally building our own labyrinth. And like, I don't know that we're gonna be able to get out of it once we've built it. Like we're, we're, we're hurting everyone into that middle part, but I'm not sure there'll be, be a string when the time is ready for us to get out. So, yeah. And again, this is something I talked about before, like right before I left Twitter and I need to revisit it, but it's this like deontic logic. And so I'll just read this. It is a field of philosophical logic concerned with obligation, permission and related concepts. Alternately, uh, denotic logic is a formal system that attempts to capture the essential logic of the concepts. It can be used to inform imperative logic or direct modality in natural languages. So it's this like, you could do this, you must do this, you can't do this. So there are these series of like decision trees of like in combinations of like you, you, and I can see this is part of both the semantic web and the cyber physical system and the smart contracting and the risk profiling is now we have our obligations or rights or opportunities are mediated through the web, through the smart contracting. So I just, I wanted to include yeah. that because I think that's an important concept that we should start to interrogate is like actually get on the same page with the people who are coding these things and understand that it is a, a structure of philosophical logic. And then do we actually agree? Like, do we want to live in a world where everything is a mother may I token? 
um, because we most people don't have their heads around that yet. Yeah, when I saw that, it I mean, that's what smart contracts are. It's about it's a, the codification of obligations, requirements, and how like the the windfalls of of what you can do and how you can do it and what your choices are. So I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. Kind of, it's interesting that, that it's 2018, but it was in Malta. And Malta was MIT's test mm -hmm. bed for a lot of stuff. Like the early blockchain identity and education was in Malta. No, no yeah, surprise because they always pick these little big states of exceptions. But yeah. Cool. So this is, this was a, uh, smart contract based weather insurance product for smallholder farmers run by Mercy Corps um, and specifically their Agrifin division. And I'll show on the other side, just like they're, so Mercy Corps is, they're a big, uh, like, you know, they call themselves a humanitarian aid organization, but they're funded by USAID, they have a long history, they were in, um, Oh, shoot. I'm forgetting the country, but they've been involved in a lot of state activities around nations being other countries being messed with. And they have, they're part of that, that sort of apparatus. Um, the, and they're tied in with a lot of the Christian organizations as well. Yeah. And one of the founders was from Israel and, or if he wasn't from Israel, he lived on a kibbutz for some time. And the other one, Ellsworth Culver, um, was very religious as well. And it came out after he had died, uh, he did really horrible stuff to his daughter and a lot of uh, like rape and other like intense sexual abuse of other kids and stuff and that sort of has come out recently and they've done they do a lot of blockchain piloting in general the the articles i've written about cello talks about this more of mercy core but they are working with all sorts of different blockchains and they have a large their agrifin sector is about both agricultural finance innovation quote unquote and um, digital technology and that sort of stuff. So this was a pilot about testing the kind of what, what or what we were describing earlier, the smart contract based weather, uh, weather insurance. And the, the diagram I had earlier was actually from this article, I believe, but the slides got kind of mixed up and I'm sorry. <laughs> science. And, <laughs> We'll talk about Acre well, Africa. Mercy Corps has been around for a while, though, right? Like, is it dates yep. to the 80s or something? This, yeah, 80s so, or 70s. Around there. Yeah, and so I think that's, like, the article on Silicon Icarus about the Nigerian Civil War and, like, the way in which development aid and the humanitarian yep. systems and, like, what is it, Barbara Ward Jackson, like, that was the necessary prerequisite for what's coming, right? Like, they didn't... They were building the smart contracts, whatever, Scott Stornetta, you know, the Mormon, whatever. Like they were in building that stuff at the, t like they had to build it up, but they knew that they needed to pave the grounds for the religious, the faith-based in interventions, the NGOs to get the global reach, the global networks. And now like, it feels like the blockchain smart contract system can just be injected into those existing networks. Yeah, exactly. And they're funded by the Agrifin sector by MasterCard Foundation and Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well. So it's like, you know, it's loosening up these places for the larger financial interests and all that. But And I just inserted this one in just about the derivatives on the insurance and whether I think Steffers had pulled this woman up, but uh, she's French mathematical professor Hylette Gaiman, uh, at, and she's also affiliated with Johns Hopkins, but her focus was securities markets and commodities and risk management. And she's been doing it for 20 years with banks, energy mining, commodity trading. And like, yeah, so the insurance derivatives and the weather derivatives, like th that's really central. And if you, and if you imagine, like, I think there's another uh, underneath it says an electricity derivative. So, 
thinking back to the Enron, right? Like, I can't remember. There was the movie. What was the name of the movie, Jason? Do you remember? Like, the Enron? Smartest like, guys the, in the room. Smartest guys in the room. And there's this scene where, essentially, like, they're gambling on the energy, and, and they have control over the grid, and that there's some cost incentive to move it out of California and send it somewhere else and then bring it back in later that was causing all sorts of rolling blackouts. And so they, they literally, and this is, I mean, this is a long time ago, like they're, they're contorting the, the people's access to electricity, not because they don't have it, but because the way they can move it through the network will, will enable them to have a financial advantage. So you can imagine the setup with these derivatives products with, with other things, like, yeah, it's decentralized kind of, but not really. Like the people who are in control, I feel like they can start to use these networks in ways that really with the cyber physical systems, many different aspects in, uh, that will impact life um, well beyond what Enron was doing the stuff. So I just wanted to, if we, if we had concerns about how the derivatives, like we've, we have already talked about it, but like, I just wanted to make sure there was, yes, insurance derivative placeholders there. Well, what's exactly. wild is all the, you know, all the people in this space or their, or their, that, that came from Enron or their off or their, or their offspring right. that, that are involved in, 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 in building a lot of this are actually, um, they come from that actual yeah, company. Yeah, <laughs> And then, and yeah, and I just put this in also just in gaming the system, like the weather company, IBM, I don't think we actually like peel back a lot of us and understand like, where does the weather data come from? Like who's manipulating it? How, like, you know, who knows how hackable data is? Like you could go in and be like, no, it's, I'm just shaving a half an inch off that rain level or adding a little bit more or tipping it. And, you know, I just, I don't think that there should be that much power concentrated in these companies. And it was saying that they're working on forecasting 25 billion forecasts a day with actionable weather data. Well, we know what actionable is, like it's gonna be feeding into all of this. So just wanted to hit on that. Well, I, I know there was a quote by um, Mark Twain, that everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. So maybe they're, <laughs> well, they're, 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 uh, <laughs> they're now they're, now they're gonna it. do something about it. <laughs> I know exactly, exactly, and I don't know. I might have a couple other things I might have slipped in. Let me see. Yeah. So again, there's like always these questions about the weather, and like, you know, they claim they can, right? I mean, this is the office of the historian of the Foreign Relations Office of 1964 to 68 in Laos, from the, the memorandum from the Deputy Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs Kohler to Secretary of State Rusk. In our view, the experiments were undeniably successful. This is cloud seeding, indicating that at least under weather and terrain conditions such as those involved, the US government has realized a capability of significant weather modification. If anything, the tests were too successful. Neither the volume of induced rainfall nor the extent of area affected can be precisely predicted. The only absolute control therefore is after the fact, in other words, to halt cloud seeding missions. And essentially they were saying they, they accomplished their strategic goals in, in Vietnam through creating enough rain to saturate and clog up the transportation routes, like for heavy vehicles. Um, and, you know, again, this is this is the 60s, um, you know, and it's it, this is a public document. This is not conspiracy theory document. This is part of that. So anyway, just in. And just to hit on more of that, so this is like Jen has done a lot of work on Langmuir and Steinmetz. So this is at Rutgers, which is interesting because, you know, my neck of the woods. So it's Einstein at the RCA Center in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, Langmuir was really central in the weather manipulation program at GE. And, um, and then Steinmetz was working in, um, you know, various you know, levels of electrifying the grid and the technocracy and Columbia University and energy currencies, like literally like like economics based on energy. So if you go to the next slide, um, it like I have just a little map. This one, so it's a little blurry, but essentially it's, it's looking at Thomas Edison, who was a theosophist, right? You know, who founded General Electric. We went, I went up to his lab in Northern New Jersey. Um, Underneath is Langmuir, who was a chemist in plasma physics and weather engineering, and, and among his projects was working on cloud seeding, so uh, projects Cirrus, Storm, and Storm Fury. 
on weather modification. And then Steinmetz was also with the GE. He founded the GE Research Lab, but went on to be part of the, the uh, Technology Alliance, Technocracy Incorporated, the Energy Survey of North America, which is 1919, uh, the idea of an energy credit currency, and then this was connected through Columbia, Howard Scott, who kind of led that for a time. And he was affiliated with M. King Hubbard, who was a petroleum engineer at Columbia. And essentially, Hubbard established the peak oil theory in the 1956. And so I think, like, again, I'm, I'm trying to sort of pull us back on the parametrics and the energetics, like back into also understanding um, the sensor networks and ecological currencies, economic currencies, and how these interactions happen. And they go back again to the early 20th century with Edison, with Langmuir, with uh, Steinmetz, and the, the underpinnings of the technocracy movement, but not because it was the socialists after us, is that ultimately the goal has been always to try to trigger the hive mind consciousness through some sort of a, an energetic, economic, free market exchange system that's tracked through distributed networking systems. Yeah. <laughs> Back to Agrofin. I basically kind of said it earlier, but this they're just saying who they're funded yeah. by. MasterCard, so, programmable money. Yeah, exactly. And so one of the partners in the project we showed earlier was Acre Africa. And so Acre Africa Africa comes out of a project called Kilmo Salama, which was ran by the Sagenta Foundation. And Sagenta mm -hmm. is a very, very large, there was Swiss-based uh, chemical company that was bought by a Chinese state-owned enterprise. I forget the name of it. I think it was mining related, but they're, they're a massive you know, fertilizer, industrial chemical company. And through their foundation, they created essentially this, it, an offshoot of that Kilmo Salma project, putting the foundations for this parametric based insurance products through Acre Africa. And they've gotten to millions of farmers at this point. And the, the woman who ran Kilmo Salma, uh, Rose Gr Grosslinga, founded this other insurance tech company called Pula, which we'll go into the next slide, but is a part of one of the first smart, like smart contract consortium insurance products ran by the Lemonade you, Foundation. Yeah. What's that? Can you go forward, Jason? I think it's, yeah, there oh. she is. Yeah, there she is. Yeah. And so she was, she was in charge of that project. Uh, she started Pula and Pula, uh, one of their funders in 2018 was the Omidyar network. Um, oh, wow. And they're you yeah, go to the next one? tied the into next. a few things. Yeah. And so this is the Lemonade Crypto Found uh, Coalition that LCCC, as they call it, <laughs> which is basically a DAO that will be governing the smart contracts that are pooling capital for parametric insurance offerings to smallholder farmers. And these are the organizations involved with it. Lemonade, the Lemonade Company is there and like kind of, I don't know, they're probably like five years old, five or 10 years old insurance tech company that has a lot of ties to Israel, which I don't have the specific. It's so, such a cheerful right little now. like font. <laughs> like it looks like something like for a preschool or something like, like it's an unusual totally. choice of font. Uh, yeah. And they, they, they sued T-Mobile for the magenta because T-Mobile had patented several shades of magenta and they have like a whole thing about how their scientists like came up with these shades of magenta and lemonade sued them over that because they that's their color is normally magenta it's not that that black but um so it's, yeah it's a, a weird connection is t-mobile is invested in cello and uh, is pretty involved in web3 in general uh, avalanche is like a it's a blockchain platform that came out of a university, oh, I was looking at it the other day, but I, f I forget which university, but they're kind of just one of these other competing 
uh, smart contract platforms, blockchain, um, built on the Ethereum virtual machine, which pretty much every blockchain is compatible with, with, with Ethereum in that way. And they are the blockchain going to be used in this coalition. And they, they recently signed a partnership with Deloitte for building a basically a accounting and verification platform for FEMA for like disaster contracting. So a smart contract based platform to basically handle the contractor relationships and the various like due diligence and accounting that is involved in all of that. So they're working with Deloitte on that. Chainlink we talked about earlier is the Oracle system. So the interface between the weather, da the weather data, however that's collected and the blockchain. So making that all that weather data executable by the smart contracts to trigger all the insurance products. Oh. Uh, I was just going to go through the other. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Oh, go ahead. Thank you're you. good. And Pula, as, as the company that Rose started, who was a part of the Sagenta Foundation, and they're another insurance tech company specifically focused on smallholder farmers. They've covered, they've gotten a million of people um, through wow. mostly parametric insurance offerings, but not exclusively. And yeah, they're, they're really doing it. And they're also one of the co-founders. His name is Thomas, and I can't pronounce his last name, but he worked for Deloitte for six years and was the lead actuary for UAP Insurance, which was like the partner with Sagenta for the Kimmel Sama project. Um, Ether Risk is a smart, con is a, they call it, you know, a decentralized smart contract based uh, platform for insurance products. So they've been kind of trying to do that for really, they're kind of an older since at least 2015. And I don't actually know what tomorrow IO is. I haven't looked into them, but Hanover re is the, you know, the big insurance company that's, that's facilitating all of this. And Dow stack is a, they're basically an organization that focuses on building DAOs and the various mechanisms of coordination and creating DAOs eventually and voting and uh, control of smart contracts. Because people probably don't quite realize, but all smart contracts have to be controlled by someone or something. And that something is generally yeah. a DAO um, or sometimes it's just controlled by a person, but um yeah exactly here's uh deloitte's website i was just looked it up magenta deloitte. shirt there i like that <laughs> i'll have to read this article a whole new world <laughs> the metaverse and what it could mean for you okay what is that circle <laughs> it looks like a petri dish is it like is it like it does look oh, uh, it's a person oh it does oh that's uh, yeah, I can't tell. Oh, they're holding up something. Oh, maybe they're doing like something magical. Oh, a <laughs> little solar stuff. Okay. Stay <laughs> out of the circle, the circle, people. Stay out of the right. circle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that the sides, I, I might have done this or things got mixed up, I but this was just from sorry. the um, uh, original Lemonade report just describing the partnership and the coalition and what they're doing. And a lot of this is really just about automating insurance contracts and automating all the financial arrangements and derivatives and secondary trading and all sorts of crazy stuff they can do with blockchain and well, it's building it's interesting because I see it says tomorrow IO generates actionable weather insights using a proprietary data and model soon to be augmented by dozens of radar equipped satellites. Yeah, so I think I, I sort of weather... feel like the radar piece is important. Like this, the frequency stuff that's bouncing around. Like I feel like all of this stuff is also dual use. Yeah, sure, mm -hmm. maybe it's getting actionable weather data, but those frequency things that they're working on is like transforming the ether, like transforming the the environment that we're inhabiting into something else. 
yeah, with all the satellites that are doing, if they're microwave, UAV, uh, UV um, radars, usually radio, and how they work is the satellites are beaming, they're literally just beaming the Earth with those frequencies and then recording the reflection back to them. Wow. So when it's a radar equipped satellite, they're beaming radio waves at the Earth and getting it back. We might, they do it with the combination of all those different um, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, then they get a lot and they can see things that you wouldn't really think they would be able to with satellites like by analyzing plants using looking at them in specific wavelengths they can tell what like um, how much photosynthesis they're doing how much like carbon sequestration they're doing all that sort of stuff so wow. they can they can really do quite a bit with 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 these satellites and is what that like the photochemistry can, guess, that, yeah, exactly i mean would that be yeah. Like, okay yeah because it's mm. the based on what the plants are emitting, like whether they're emitting, emitting UV at a certain, you know, a certain amount of um, electron emissions at different times, they can tell what's going on. And, wow. And, well, and Allison, I know like you've been looking into just the, the use of radium and radio, uh, isotopes and in terms of tracking, in terms of like actually like yeah monitoring. that's going to come up exactly. in a bit like that's, leo did okay. a lot of work on radium yeah. and then i i did i've done like more about the tracking the okay. carbon so i think and this was just the i mentioned it earlier but the deloitte with that avalanche blockchain and their partners well the ledgers it's all these accounting firms it's the big accounting firms right the accentures the deloitte's the kpmgs yep. like they're the exactly. they're the embodiment of the web3 contract layer and, you know, I can't imagine like how many lawyers, like, I don't, I don't feel like for the most part, people who are doing contract law broadly understand the changes that are going to be coming. Like, I, I, I mean, you know, in the, in these spaces, you hear all these people, you know, the constitutionalists or whatever. And I'm like, you're not getting to your constitution. That web, that smart contract yeah. layer is going to be between <laughs> you and whatever idea of rights you think you have. Like, like if you mm -hmm. constitutionalists like need to get to work and figure out web three and like, whatever, like. I'm not totally confident in the constitution, like as it is, but if you think it is, then you need to fight for it. Cause like, you're gonna be wrapped up in the cocoon of the, the sticky web three data layer. You're never getting through to that, like any kind of justice. You're just gonna be stuck in arbitration, like in some automated law system. And I, I looked it up real quick, Avalanche, they come out of Cornell. Just, just so Oh, you know. okay. You know, after the stuff about Odom and studying the bird, heart, bird heartbeats, like I think of Cornell really differently because I used to only think about Cornell as like the birds, you know, like they were known for birding. Right. Like right. that was like the thing I knew them for was like, oh, they're the people who like bird song. And I'm thinking like now that I understand wave and frequency and stuff it, and field theory, it feels a little creepier. I can totally imagine like the ecosystem services of songbirds or something being like factored in. Well, to your psychological well-being. Creating yeah. NFT around on the blockchain. Okay. Yeah, so this is a video, we probably should just play it. It, it was pretty crazy, if I remember correctly, about the, the Red Cross catastrophe bond, the volcano bond that was securitized by Replexus. In the video, there's a whole community currency aspect that was a part of this oh. deal that that'll be talked about in the, and that was done through um, Grassroots economics was a, a part of this. And th at my art, I have an article that, that goes into all the details okay. more, but let's just play the video. Huh? Okay, give me one second. I just have to add one thing. Uh, oh, okay. And so I can get the audio. I, I didn't realize. Uh, I, I downloaded the other videos. It'll take me two seconds. One second. Audio on oh, no worries. I'll talk about. Um, so the third party verifier in this case is Mitiga Solutions. And they were a spinoff from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which is in this like crazy cathedral, oh, which we have in yeah, a couple of slides. Yeah, okay, I'm remembering, um, yeah. Yeah, and they are 
they're a relatively new company, but they're basically all about weather modeling and, and artificial intelligence and all that sort of stuff. And they have their, they were in part incubated by Microsoft and they're part of their planetary computer system. And they work also for a lot of, they work for NATO, they work for other defense contractors. Indra is a big one in Spain, as well as uh, Rolls-Royce and some of, and other insurance companies too, like AXA and um, Howden Group. But I had the, there's a slide ahead that, that shows this. Yeah. Okay, I got I got it set up here. Oh, cool. The delivery of capital into a region affected by a humanitarian emergency, like a natural disaster, quickly and at the right time, is critical to enabling the best possible humanitarian response. To that end, Danish Red Cross is turning to Insurance Linked Securities, or ILS, to secure and disperse financing for humanitarian response in a more efficient manner. ILS are financial instruments which are sold to investors whose value is affected by an insured loss event. The most prevalent form of ILS traded on capital markets are catastrophe bonds, or CAT bonds. A CAT bond is a security that is used to transfer risk of financial loss arising from a catastrophic event from the sponsor to investors in a similar way to how a person insures their property against loss or damage. In 2020, the Danish Red Cross is sponsoring not only the world's first humanitarian catastrophe bond, but also the industry's first pure volcano CAT bond. Worldwide, 500 million people live near 1,500 active volcanoes. Individuals who may not be completely displaced from an eruption still suffer significant financial, livelihood, and human loss. For example, in 2010, one of Indonesia's most active volcanoes, Mount Merapi, caused economic losses of 750 million US dollars. This parametric cat bond is structured such that the principal is paid to Danish Red Cross if specified trigger conditions are met. Matika Solutions, an insure tech company merging natural hazard expertise with supercomputing optimization, has developed the trigger methodology for this cat bond. The trigger is based on a hybrid approach. The first part of the payout is defined by the occurrence of a volcanic eruption, as measured by the column height of the ash plume. The second part is determined based on the wind direction, impacting the ash cloud's dispersion, and thus, directly linked to the area most afflicted. To mitigate against concerns that if there is an eruption that doesn't trigger the bond, we have tiered the triggers across multiple predetermined ash plume heights. Replexus will set up the issuer for the cat bond, create, issue, and settle the notes digitally on a private permissioned blockchain system developed by Replexus. Once on the blockchain, investors can purchase the securities and trade them on a secondary market, using the blockchain with other ILS investors who also have access to the blockchain. Matiga has developed the long-term probabilistic model to calculate expected financial loss to investors in the event of an eruption, as well as a short-term deterministic impact model, churning out post-eruption risk scenarios, thereby allowing the Danish Red Cross to deploy the funds it receives from the triggered bond to the greatest effect on the ground. The aim is to take advantage of capital markets and financial structural innovation combined with complex natural hazard modeling to deliver and deploy emergency funding exactly when most required and in a highly efficient manner. I just want to want to know what happens if there's not a lot of plume, but there's a lot of lava. <laughs> To me, I'm like when, a when <laughs> oh. Did you want to say some, yeah, some more about that? Uh. Yeah, no, I, I was just quickly double checking something. Um, but the part they didn't talk about is that in the areas that are this affected by the volcano eruptions, that what, what Mitica was doing, they're not just modeling the the environmental dynamics and the financial dynamics of what happens when certain things are triggered. It's also the local communities, and they were all, and also um, 
like their their economics and a part of the disaster relief scenarios like that capital that the Danish Red Cross would deploy it would actually be used as collateral for community currencies in those areas um, mm. facilitated by like grassroots economics and the whole I mean in short the whole community currency paradigm for development aid is basically having collateral based on with like fiat regular currency and then using that to mint create these community currencies that they like geofence or ha can only be used in a certain area by that group and circulate in that way and it's a way for them to create more money uh, essentially based on like a smaller pool of uh, capital and collateral and then it ties in with all the you know connected the surveillance and digital twinning and stuff with the local dynamics but yeah yeah it's a part they didn't talk about well i threw this in because i think it, it just ties back into the lds like connection and the coral bond and stuff but not surprisingly they're very connected to the red cross and disaster relief and you know that was something that came up in in that the article about nigeria is the the way in which you know religious communities sort of glom on to you know disaster humanitarian things and and use it to their you know to advance other sorts of agendas so this is from 2018 but they're like they're the first leader of this you know american red cross like major givers fund and so I can imagine that a lot of the this outreach, maybe community currency and these things might have involvement of faith-based communities in in managing services or what have you, which would interface with the community currency, I think. And and then they'll get the human capital piece of it because I think Raul actually made an article about one of these volcano, like uh, one of the islands in the Caribbean that had a volcanic eruption and then there was there were issues with people's health status of getting off island. But like I, I can see that the displacement piece from the disasters will be a central part. Like you'll manage the natural capital piece, the ecosystem services, like the disaster piece, manage the human capital piece and the displacement on the other end. And I think many of the displaced people will end up, you know, doing remote work that will uphold the digital panopticon program. So that's all I had yeah, to say Yeah, and like there. be a part of like the building, the, the building blocks program where they have you know, their housing yeah. and education and all that stuff tied mm -hmm. into one sort of All integrated, thing. yeah. And this is just yeah. another, this was like microcredit, which to me, like the microcredit, microinsurance, it's it's the same sort of thing. So that the article talked about initially about the history with Grameen being the beginning. But, you know, of course, a lot of this is, you know, centers on entrepreneurship, right? Capabilities of low-income people and refugees. But they're, they're definitely looking at, like micro transactions in a in an aid space, a global aid space. That's can, and and the church is very globally networked, right? Like if you were going to work at a global level, like if it wasn't the Catholic Church, it would probably be LDS because they have such a robust mission program. I need to and actually then, move spots from where I am. I didn't deserve to sit here long I know. enough. I, I, well, you know what, Leo? I'm not sure. Is there some more? Like, did we not? Did we get to Leo's stuff? Like, we didn't really talk stuff? about Oak Ridge at all. But that was we have okay. a lot more you can, slides. You had more. You had more <laughs> slides there. But um, yeah, we well, could talk about yeah, that another need... time. Um, I just need yeah. to move spots. Like you can talk in this library. It's just I. There, you can like reserve a little room, and I only did it for three hours, which I knew would. <laughs> <laughs> Thought we would get it done Less then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, yeah. Um, do you want to? Um, do you want to duck out, or do you want to? Like, do you want to? I mean, I can just. I'm. I'm happy. It'll just take like a couple minutes to move. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm happy you, to keep you, going. It's just, I just probably should. All right, I mean, yeah. I probably, I might be able to just stay, but. Yeah. If nobody's jumping on your case, it's, you know, but uh, yeah, it's up to you, whatever, whatever works. Are they, not, are they, are they, they are eyeballing like, you? We have, we, we, have, we have, no, no, it's just like, we have a fair amount. Like I'm assuming this, to get through all this stuff, it'd probably be another like hour and a half an hour. at least. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've got quite can, a few like, more could, slides. I can go faster on some of it, but yeah. Yeah, I actually have to I have to go. Yeah, I'll I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. be back in a minute. Okay. Okay. All right. One more. 
<laughs> you want to just imagine yeah, that? Yeah, Leo, go, and then we can. I mean, I could probably keep talking about some stuff while he resettles if it's not his slides. Sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. Sure. Which piece? Um, I think I slipped some stuff in. Yeah. His. I mean, this was his, his next slide. Was this? Oh, okay. Then I should. I guess I should wait. Yeah. Um, I think that's the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Yeah, let me look at our live stream and see uh, if you guys are uh, on the live stream. Do you have any, have any questions? Anybody have any questions while we're, there? While we're waiting? <laughs> for, <laughs> thanks for sticking with us, you guys. It's never, it the never excitement of insurance, automated insurance. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to your automated luxury insurance prison. <laughs> Can we help yeah. you today? Well, just I still haven't figured, you know, like, you know, you want to see the the map of how this whole thing, how all this works out. And obviously the insurance is a huge, huge piece of it. Um, but I, I still don't really understand how, how it all fits together, you know, how all these different pieces actually fit together. Cause they, they do fit together. <laughs> I'm sure of that. Well, I mean, the reality is, is as far as I'm concerned, I think that the people at the top who are advancing these initiatives, like the goal of the machine learning, the emergent consciousness, I feel that they, if, if I'm not saying that they can necessarily fabricate things out of nothing, but I think that they can precipitate disasters like incipient deaths. I mean, we know that they can make economic disasters, right? We know that they can conduct war. We know that they can use like geopolitics to create the disaster, like capitalism that they want. Um, you know, They've admitted that the U.S. government and the Chinese government, I mean, they've, they've, it's pretty out in the open about weather engineering. I mean, there is some question about maybe the tectonics, right? Like if you can, like what might be available to them in terms of mobilizing like the, the plate <laughs> network. So it feels like in a lot, lot of respects, there are many disasters that can be made. Now, how closely can they dial it in? Like, I don't know that we're there, like that you could just like on demand turn up a thing that you want, but over time, if the goal is to displace people and to move them into these new spaces where they will be tokenized, put in temporary smart environments, be made to go through their paces, jump the hoops, all of that is going to be being fed into the into the simulation. And I think for, for me now, beyond the money and the control, that's the thing they most value is like some sort of natural and social simulation data. And that that's going to come through dispossession, which you know, I'm very familiar with what that dispossession looks like in a socioeconomic level. But hmm. now we're simply layering in like um, managing natural systems towards that effect. And, um, you know, and some of the stuff doesn't even have to be a disaster. Like I can to fully imagine that the corporate environmental agenda will start to displace people off of land, like even indigenous people from their own lands in the name of greening, right, in the name of decarbonization. And so, like, essentially, we've written them a blank check under the climate carbon framing that we they can just do whatever the hell they want. And then, like, the, you know, it's, it's like being in a bad relationship where someone threatens to kill themselves if you don't do everything they want. Like, that's sort of where we're at. We've the vast majority of the public has bought that, that if we don't do every last thing in the cybernetic control grid, we're all going to die and we're going to kill the planet. And I just, I don't believe that, actually. I, I believe there's a lot of harm and I believe things need to be fixed, but I'm not buying that the line that they're selling. So for me, that's, that's why I'm sorry that it ended up getting sort of drawn out beyond insurance. But as the opportunity of the, the disaster capitalism being the shock to the system, and, you know, I... I couldn't track down the source, so take it with a grain of salt. But I remember reading at one point, I, there was a lab, I believe it was at Harvard during World War II, where they were doing in the Air Force that they would develop models where you would create a shock to like an airplane wing and see how the reverberation happened and then readjust the design based on trying to tune it, like you would tune it, tune in to what you wanted. And that they used that modeling scenario for economic modeling. But they could they could dial in an economic c catastrophe. I mean, that's what the Chicago boys were so good at, right? You could dial in a price hike, a same break, a war, or something to 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 create the frequency pattern and the after effect that you wanted. And so they've been doing that for you know eighty years or so in the simulation. We've been living in the consequences of the simulation, but I think up to now it's been mostly simulations around 
economies and geopolitics, but not so much about climate or human capital management. Hmm. Yeah. I don't well, know, does that make sense? It does. And you know, it's, it's so funny because you would, you would think someone like Naomi Klein would have, would, would know this. I mean, she wrote, she wrote the shock doctrine for crying out loud. Right. I know. <laughs> yeah. Kind of incredible. Um, and again, like life as simulation, you know, like the, all the decision making, you know, outsourcing it to <coughs> data and simulations, like we don't really understand like what the implication, the full implications of that are. Um, you know, like I said, I was at the smart cities thing and they're talking about the digital twinning and how you can model these things. And I'm like, well, yeah, what about people, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and uh, it was just like, oh, we wouldn't thought of they, they knew though. Like, I mean, like privately, like they knew. Um, You're not yeah. supposed to talk about that yet. I mean, not publicly. That's <laughs> not publicly. And, you know, it is funny because yesterday I revisited one of my blog posts, like my first blog post is a little podcasty thing. And, you know, I was commenting on it. And, you know, I was reflecting on this social emotional learning, social impact bonds. And when I went to down to DC and I was, you know, I got a, a question and I was asking, like, how would you know if the offset? for a middle school social emotional learning curriculum was going to be, um, uh, you know, uh, addiction and incarceration, like how would you know to track? And like, clearly it was going to be these soul bound tokens, but it's different now. Like they weren't going to talk about it in 2017 or 2018, whatever then, like they probably all knew about it. All the people in the room, Goldman Sachs would have known, but they weren't prepared to talk about it. So they just didn't answer my question, you know? So we'll try not to get you a sunburn, Leo. Can hear. Did I lose you? Oh, I'm here. I can. Oh. Uh, hey, you, you, you're completely out outdoors, huh? Darn it! I thought this would work. Yeah, that signal's not very good there. No, I'll I'll try. I'll, I'll try somewhere else. It's not the bathroom. You'd be like in the stall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, yeah, just get back with us. We can come back to it if you guys would rather just like do the other part some other time. I don't know. How are you feeling? I'm, I'm flexible. Yeah. I mean, we could risk. I mean, we probably have, we've gone three hours. We could probably go another three hours actually, because there's quite a few more slides. Uh, how many more slides do we have? What slide are we on? 37 there's a total of 69 slides and we're at 37 so we're um yeah a little over half well, we, we could cut it. leo has this slide and one more slide i think that's the core of his stuff so okay maybe if he gets persuaded we could um finish that part and take a break and then we could if yeah open it yeah we back. can we can break it up into two. Maybe I'll feel a little bit better too. I, I'm just between my coughing and everything. It's just like I'm, I'm. Three hours is a long time. Is there anybody still left? Does anybody have thoughts? Or uh, like the co the conversation kind of just stopped. Uh, yeah. really, we I mean, bored everybody to death with insurance talk. Uh, like like often, uh, a lot of the conversation doesn't. It's unrelated. It, it kind of seems unrelated. The <laughs> <laughs> story story of our life. Our, our live streams um but yeah uh there's it says there's 43 uh, youtube is allowing 43 people to watch this right now to listen to, to our conversation. <laughs> yeah yeah um okay well let's let's wait for for leo to come back here and yeah i think maybe it's a good idea just to do a little bit more and then we'll I'll save everything and we'll just do those last yeah. slides on a second go around because we, we did a pretty good. Yeah, number. I mean, because essentially that's more oak isotope. So, um, yeah, that, 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 that's probably a logical place to stop. I think most of those are ones that I put in. Okay. You like this shot of, of uh, Leo here, though. He's <laughs> <laughs> windblown. The windblown Leo. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, it is interesting to think like just the, the visuals of this image of the supercomputing center in this church, right? Because it is this, it feels like the church of science, right? The church of the computer um, replacing, 
you know, a natural, you know, creator sacred with this profane cold system. Like it even has to be disconnected, you know, yeah, in this, yeah. its own air conditioned room. I mean, that it's very significant. It feels very, um, you know, again, I, I hate to keep going back to it, but it's, it's like, what are we going to choose? Are we going to, are we going to fall in with the, the panic of that? We have to comply or it's a game over. Or are we going to figure that within the world, a dynamic natural world, which, which has, you know, power and possibility beyond what we can imagine that we could come up with some other options, right? Yeah. And, uh, Someone said, I don't feel like the conversation was totally unrelated. That's true. There is there is some of it that's that's related. I'm not <laughs> saying it's none of it's related. Um, I guess we're always just looking for like more like direct it's I'm related. just curious, like, I don't, I mean, are other people, has it, have, have anybody in there, like, are there folks, like, talking about sort of the Web3 and... It's, it's like, well, a lot of the conversation is more general, like, more, you know, kind of just yeah. more general about the Great Reset and, you know, like, uh, but it, it's not getting into the specifics of what we're, what we're actually sharing here, so... I guess that's what I was yeah. talking about. But yeah, it's going to be difficult moving forward because, you know, I, like, I think about that, you know, like, I really, like... I don't want to participate in this thing. You know, I, I don't want to have a smartphone and don't want to, um, you know, move, I, I'm, I'm starting to learn Linux again. I'm trying to figure out ways where I can, you know, function in this world without being a part of that. But it's, it's, it seems like it's going to be increasingly difficult just for even basic necessities, you know, or, you know, you just, we're going to have to figure out ways that we can, operate and we can like yeah i don't know <laughs> it's yeah it's gonna be a tough it's gonna be Hello. a tough tough one hey so leo we were thinking that we might i think we have this slide and the next one is yours with the names and then we can maybe take a break and like come back to it later and if okay. if you don't feel up for it like later i think most of the back end stuff is mine too so if i mean we'd love to have you but if you have other obligations at some point like i could oh, carry that back end Wait, do you mean like, okay, um, like on a different day? Oh, oh, yeah. No, I can, I can do it. Could break this up and like maybe you could schedule the room again, uh, another yeah. day, and we could just like because there's quite a few more. I mean, we probably have at least, I'd say to do this right, there's probably at least an hour, hour more of uh, content. Yeah, the whole Oak Ridge, all that ecological. Stuff yeah. So how are you feeling? Do you want to? Do you want to? I mean, like maybe in a week or something, we could come back. And, yeah. and, and, but let's like, we could finish, you know, do have you do these last two slides. I think it's this one. And then the, the next one is the names, like the black, as I remember. Yeah. Oh, okay. I yeah. I mean, I don't really have so much to add. It's like the image kind of says it all. Um, they, I'm not sure exactly. Like I need to look more into the Barcelona supercomputing center, but it was one of the largest in Europe. It's not like as cutting edge anymore. Um, but it's like built it's in the, this cathedral like that's that's what it looks like um, in barcelona and well, it's pretty and i just want to say like my long piece <laughs> kind of like whatever like about the refugees about barcelona about like it was really centered like a lot of that like the mondragon or mondragon um cooperative and the role of the, the Vatican in that, like that was in, like it wasn't exactly Barcelona, but it was nearby, like in that part of Spain. And so I, I feel like, I don't know. I mean, we were listening to like Spain around the graphite stuff, but I think, I don't know that like people have a lot of attention on the role of Spain in this, but I think, I think it is significant. And I think a lot, especially some of like the more socialist leaning cooperative kind of, you know, elements that, that blockchain is gonna go after the left is like a decentralized horizontal like autonomous you know great options for you know non-hierarchical and this is this is part of like one of the things i was talking about like with the refugees um and i don't know jason if you can see down to the slide deck there's one that actually is about refugees that how far down it's like a woman uh it says holacracy something like that like refugees i don't know how far down it is in the slide deck but Oh, it's pretty far down. Never mind. Okay, it's that one. We'll wait. We'll wait till next time. It's well here. Well, maybe I'll just say like so, like in the in the refugees, like because like, I think it does build. So can we just skip to her? Like 
the idea of this edge, like I feel like, so it's, it's like Steffers is teaching me more about like the encoding, right? The imprinting of language and images on this. So this organization is called the Enlivening Edge, right? So we've already established that the cyberneticists are imagining that there's order from chaos on the edge. And it's it's talking about a refugee in self-organization, right? So that is totally like a decentralized network blockchain system, like within a refugee encampment. You, you've got the community conversations with just all of the circles. Like you talk about edges, like just look at that on the right with all of the edges. and they're actually developing something called holacracy, which is a trademark. It's like an or a management theory of horizontal organization, like flexible, autonomous. And I believe what's happening is that they will create in partnership with humanitarian aid and faith-based communities, like through disaster capitalism, whether natural or economic or war, decentralized pop-up communities with a certain level of smart infrastructure um, that are going to be framed with all of these services that are going to essentially have people perform agency, right? Like perform interactions, use these community currencies. Leo, you've talked about that before with Cello and then make them visible to the machine. So somehow I feel like they imagine that if they get enough of these data sets that they can start to like bubble up this emergence of what they think they want from like, it's like a mirrored humanity, like some sort of, I don't know exactly what it looks like. It, I, it That doesn't feel like biogeochemical, but there, there's some sort of energetic that they're seeking in these circles and that the holacracy, the holon is central to that. And they're, that sign says like social innovation academy, they're developing these refugees as social entrepreneurs. So there's a disconnect from your, your original place into a place you have no connection to, you have no energetic connection to, you have no like limited social connections, that's erased and you're put in a whole new place as an agent in an agent modeling simulation. And so um, anyway, that, that that's one of the things I wanted just to piggyback on with the community currencies is it is that dislocation and then the restart of like, okay, so let's create a fresh, a new interactive system and model it, right? And and use it and and but on the cheap, right? Like the the guy who was at the MTA, uh Vinay Gupta, like the refugee guy, the hexayurt guy, they're gonna come up with these pop-up, you know, green, solar, whatever, like with some sort of minimal, and they may not have high tech telecom, but you know, that's what what's coming is these new next gen nuclear um modular systems and and they've literally said like this is great for disasters and humanitarian aid like they've said like that's part of their marketing for nucleation capital it's like they're intending that that's what that's going to be for so they're just it's you know we've been conditioned like even in philadelphia with pop-up like pop-up beer gardens pop-up like you know using these cargo containers to create like sort of you know shabby chic you know hipster spaces but the whole pop-up like stripped down ethos, I think it's just going to pervade all of it. And and I think that the, the natural disasters are going to be a big part of it. So yeah. anyway, I just wanted to make yeah. sure that we link that onto your community currency conversation. Definitely. And like a part of a lot of the community currency and like blockchain based UBI projects are like health surveys and all these sorts of they gather data, not just from like the transactions and that sort of thing, but often like kind of give them or force them to take out these these surveys about like their health stuff and Mitiga was involved in the grassroots economics red cross community currency projects and a part of the like uh, mining that data and using the the health survey data from the community currency pilot well, was interesting that Mitiga um, they called it community inclusion currency yeah and so like mm -hmm. uh if you don't have it, it you have community exclusion you know like <laughs> i mean it implies that you know without this thing you're not you're not included unless you have this this currency um yeah and they're, they're starting to experiment too with like geo-based community currency so like on the smart contract level it could only you could only trade the currency if you're within like a predefined geographical range mm -hmm. Um, and that's the Astral Protocol. They're working with Cello and all the others. Uh, but yeah, wow. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot of that, and, and they're creating the whole just 
any sort of for geographical data um, tied into smart contracts. They're building all of that. Did you want to say something you about this one? Up to the yeah. Is there anything on that? Yeah, I think you talked I mean, about honestly, them. I, yeah. yeah. I wish it, I wish I had more. There's definitely a lot more research to do, but just these were on their website, the list of uh, organizations that they're working with. And there's a lot of aerospace here. Um, they do a lot with the Euro, Euro control is the like air traffic controller for the European Union. So they're working with them. Um, you know, NATO, just straight up. Indra is a big one in Spain uh, with like aerospace. Is Indra and energy defense or is it just blockchain? Uh, is it Indra, no, they're, they're, um, they're like, uh, they're like aerospace. Oh. Okay. Like a, just a yeah, big they're going to rule us from there. I mean, that's the thing. Like, it's, yeah, exactly. And the satellites and all that, because they're, that's what Matiga is all about, is the modeling from the satellite data. How long will it take them to all fall down if we stop maintaining them? <laughs> I know. Did you guys see the announcement? The uh, space, was it SpaceX and, and uh, or T-Mobile and SpaceX just made an announcement about a partnership like two days ago? Uh, Elon Musk, you know, came out or whatever with, but yeah, they're, they're, uh, Starting next year, they're going to allow satellite uh, on your phone with uh, T-Mobile and SpaceX. SpaceX is launching a satellite specifically for uh, cellular service. So it's like the idea that you know you'll you'll even out in the middle of the desert you'll be able to get. Um, but they say it's like next year it'll be beta or whatever. But they just made a big announcement. I don't know if you saw that. Um, yeah. Somebody told me that he was backing known. the nuclear stuff. Mm. Yeah. T-Mobile is quite involved in Web3 and digital identity and Salo specifically. They're invested in, uh, in our, like the big, one of Salo's big things is being able to tie your phone number to your crypto address like automatically. So you can just send crypto to phone number and T-Mobile is helping with that infrastructure. Well, the other day I was like, this, you know, you have your, you have your SIM card. And I was like, wait a minute, what's the SIM? A, a, a SIM, because you know, you have the SIMs, you know, simulation and whatever. So I looked yeah. up like, what, what does SIM stand for? It's subscriber identity module. Did you guys know that? That's, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't know that, but anyway. Um, yeah, it's, it is. So it's like, in a, in a way we like our SIM cards are kind of our, um, you know, it, it, we already have kind of a digital ID in a sense. Totally. <laughs> well, I was trying to set up my little podcasty thing, like, or put them on places, but you had to always like attach it to your email or your phone number or something. Like, so when you overstep, they can just go and pull it all up at once. You know, it, it's a little creepy yeah. the feeling. I mean, not that I'm, you know, whatever, just in general. No. Yeah. I was wondering, like, are there all right, well, were there questions? Oh, yeah. There? I have not seen any questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think this material is kind of new. It's hard for people yeah. to like figure out. Like, There's a lot. Them to death. Yeah, I've yeah. been yeah. I've been myself catching up on all this stuff. You know, like, uh, so it's 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 a lot of this is new to me as well. So <laughs> I'm with yeah, you guys. I'm definitely <laughs> still learning how to talk about it and stuff. It's, it's hard. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's un almost unimaginable having to talk about it. Like that's the thing, <laughs> but. And yet yeah. we have to do it. So, wow. Well, thank you, Leo. Yeah, for, thanks. For, yeah, thanks yeah, a lot. Thank you. Well, we, we'll, thanks for hosting, Jason. We'll, we'll come do the second half. Yeah. We'll schedule another. I don't know why it does that. We'll yeah, schedule I think another. it's the Oak Ridge stuff. Is, it's a yeah. little easier, I feel like, yeah. to digest. Yeah. Well, well, within the next week or so, we'll, we'll have another one of these. Uh, cool. Oh, Chris, uh, someone said Christine asked a question, sort of. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to, I don't think I'm going to be able to find that. So Christine, if you want to throw it back up there again, uh, I'll, I'll find it, but I've been trying to follow the, 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 the chat, but I didn't see Was a there question. Anything? 
Um, yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, it, I feel like we keep wandering further and further. Like, it's not actually like we're aimless. It's not that we're like not going towards a destination. Like, this is the de the destination is like radio eugenics hive mind consciousness. Like, that is the destination. Yeah, but totally. most people just don't have the capacity to hold it, right? Like, they they literally they've kind of carved out the things that they're interested in, and then they just follow that. Like, whatever the updates are on whatever you know, subset. <laughs> and, you know, it takes a certain level of commitment to sort of try to figure this out because it's not obvious. Like, and you have to be willing to feel pretty uncomfortable about it. Cause once you realize like, Hey, yeah, they can control, like they can mess with the weather. They can like bet on like demolishing whole towns and they don't mind it. And it's soon it's going to be automated. And, and by the way, we're going to like coat the world in smart dust. It's a lot, but I, I don't know until we can figure out a way to articulate it clearly that we're going to be able to redirect other than just put put our intention out there to try to hold space for some other option. Yeah, and having the story straight, I think, is really important. Christine, uh, the question was, uh, I haven't heard Allison speak to sex tech. Actually, you have, Allison. Uh, there's like, I think there's like 800 and 900 videos on your channel, so... Get watching, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, mostly, I mean, uh, se sex tech and the por pornography, and to see how the ener energy harvesting could fit in with sex tech. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah. I feel like yeah. the, the well, what What's Left podcast they they had a really interesting little discussion about the sex tech stuff. That and yeah. to kind of talk about that the energy har harvesting. Whatnot. Yeah. Well, when I was, I think it was last year, they were, when all the graphene stuff was really coming out, like there's a lot of graphene in um, like scuba suits and haptic suits. And, you know, to me, the wearables, the idea of like camming, right? And teledildonics and, and the stuff that you can, like as much as, you know, there might be some people out there, you know, who, who like listening about parametric insurance. Like there's probably more people out there who are interested in like other entertainment options, right? <laughs> but like with these haptics, like you could literally have one person like, you know, digitally involved with dozens or if not hundreds of people. Like that's the thing. And what I keep saying, like through a haptic suit, right? Like you put on your haptic suit, I put on my haptic suit. Like these are like the, the worlds that are being built. And this is, like that was one of my real reasons I had such a hard stop with, with Derek bros about the digital child labor, because I'm like, yeah, like, so today it's playing a card game. Like tomorrow it's what, like kitty sex porn? Like you have to go there because clearly the people who are running these systems, like that's where their mind is gonna go. Like what are the protections, right? Like, oh, you can do, like kids should be able to do any kind of work. Well, maybe not, right? And so, you know, and, and we went to Rockfin and that was, you know, again, this is not in any way about them specifically, but when we said like, sure, there's some people who like an intellectual podcast. There's some people who like, you know, titillating content. Um, the AI wants to know all the stuff. Like it wants to know like how to be like, you know, brainy, <laughs> you know, it wants to know how to be sexy. Like it wants to, it wants to sit on your shoulder, tap, tap, tap and go, how do you do that? Like, what does it feel like? What are you thinking? Like, that's the mirror. And so every bit of life, I feel like is, they're trying to provoke it. Like, whether it's like the happiest parts, the most tragic parts, like it, it leads towards extremity. I feel like, like right now, like it's got a lot of the basics, you know, now it's really triggering for extreme, more extreme content. And I, I feel like, um, like beyond the predatory nature of it or the finance nature of it, um, that that it's it's the consciousness, right? Like where is your consciousness in that state, space? And you know, I, I I wrote about the. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but that they were looking at, uh, you know, those stable coins, right? Like Leo, like energetic linked energy back stable coin stuff for erasing the quantum thermodynamic you know, pushing the, whatever, the, the demon box or whatever, the Maxwell's demon. And that like, theoretically your piezoelectric body, like your heartbeat could, could power that. Now they, they might say, oh, well you have some sort of, you know, induced injury and now you need a heart monitor. And so that's 
how they get it implanted, but then ultimately that heart monitor maybe end up being your wearable and your interface with Web3 and like whatever extra power you have is erasing data for the, this quantum thermodynamic like free energy wheel. Um, so yeah, so there's there's the, you know, digital sex tech and then there's but then there's also like the heart space like there, there, there's the 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 physical part but then there's also like the spiritual and sacred part too like all parts of love and experience and minds and bodies it wants it wants possession of that it wants to possess it and but it can only possess it in ones and zeros and it's that's not i mean i just that's only a, a small, like that's only an echo, the faintest echo of what it actually is. So, totally. great. Well, let's uh, we'll schedule another one of these here coming up. Thank you, Leo and Allison and everyone that's uh, been sticking with us here. Uh, All right. Until next time. time. Thank yeah. you, folks. Yeah. Have yeah. Fun. All yeah, right. Bye, fun. Leo. Hopefully, uh, yeah. Give this us is a crazy feedback image. on that. Like this is like yeah, and I did yeah. see ILS on that video, that Red Cross video. It did say ILS. Yeah, oh, the Danish insurance Red link Cross. securities. Yeah, that's what. Yeah.